Oh man, oh man, oh man, oh man, oh man. We are live, ladies and gentlemen. We are live. I want to say I apologize for the, the late start. It wasn't on purpose. Turn off the YouTube right here. All right, so peace and love to y'all, man. I want to say um good evening to everybody. Today we have a special debate. This is the first of many to come. And I just want to say that we are putting on a debate free for the people because I think everybody deserves to see this dialogue. Never before done in the conscious community, we've had a PhD and a brother from the Israelite community debating about if Jesus existed. This is something that the conscious community has been arguing about for years. And I thought my brother, and I'm going to say it again, my brother, Gorilla Hebrew, would be the perfect person to have this conversation. So I'm bringing it to you today, family, for free. But bear in mind, I do have my cash app across the screen, and you're going to see it in the chat because I still have to pay these debaters out of my pocket. All right? So although it's free, I still got to pay them. So if you can, a donation of $5, $10, whatever you have, you'll see the cash app pinned at the top in the YouTube and also going across the screen. AxBrotherGarfield at gmail.com. Special shout out to Deacon of Destruction and my brother Hassad and sister um, Halima in the building. All right? Peace and love to y'all. And I'm going to introduce to you right now. This is the host for the evening, my brother and your brother, Christian Corey from the God First Gang. Corey, my job is done. It's Get all in your way. hands, brother. I'm out of here. Man. Get out of the way. Out. Get out of the way. Shout out right. to the Chief, the good brother Garfield, um, for putting this together. Um, Chief Priest, um, Alazar, as well as um, Dr. Richard Carrier, uh, should put on a heavy show. Make sure you subscribe to the Brother Garfield podcast as well because he has a lot of things in store. Um, I want to firstly, before we get into that, I'm Christian Corey, uh, spiritually known as Nadiab Shakab of the Tabernacle of David by way of God First Gang. Uh, we want to get right into this debate because we all were already been waiting for a good half an hour. First, I want to lay out the uh, rules and the structure um, to the people in the room so they'll know and be able to follow as well. Um, so we're going to start off with the introductions by the moderator slash the debater. Um, that's going to take a few minutes, not long. We're not going to time that on both sides. Uh, Gorilla Hebrew has elected to go first the entire debate. So <clears throat> he'll be going first. And then we have the opening presentations. The opening presentations, Gorilla Hebrew will be going first five minutes. And then we'll have Dr. Richard Carrier following up five minutes right after that. Then we'll go into the first round. The first round will be 15 minutes apiece. Gorilla Hebrew first. And then a PhD scholar, Dr. Richard Carrier, will go for 15 minutes. Then we'll go into the first round rebuttal. Still in the same round, but the first round rebuttal. Five minutes, you'll have Gorilla Hebrew, and then we'll have Dr. Richard Carrier go for five minutes on his rebuttal. And then we'll move into the second round. The second round will have the same structure as the first round. 15 minutes, Gorilla Hebrew. 15 minutes, Dr. Richard Carrier. And then we'll have five minutes rebuttal for Gorilla Hebrew. Five minute rebuttal for Dr. Richard Carrier. Third round, same structure. 15 minutes for Priest <clears throat> Alazar, and then we'll have um, 15 minutes for Dr. Richard Carrier, and then we'll go five minute rebuttal round for Gorilla Hebrew, five minute rebuttal round for Dr. Richard Carrier. So we have first round, second round, third round covered. After that, we'll get into our question and answer round, our questionnaire round. Each debater gets to ask the other debater five questions in a seven minute period. Um, that answer section will not be time but i'll try to keep uh that pretty tight to make sure that five questions is clearly asked within the seven minute period and give space for the answers for each um the only time i will be chiming in if there's technical difficulties uh for some reason the debaters have tangled themselves up and they can't untangle in a questionnaire round or uh to chime in and say one minute left uh, at the end of a round other than that uh, we good to go. We want to go ahead and get started. Let's see if we can bring the uh, the guests in. Let's see if we can bring them in right quick. Uh, let's see if we can add Dr. Richard Carrier. Dr. Richard Carrier, are you here? Chime in if you can speak. Yeah, I totally can, yeah. <clears throat> good deal. And hit the chat and make sure that Dr. Richard Carrier is clear. Myself is clear as well. Brother Garfield, yeah, yeah, yeah. he shouldn't be speaking. <clears throat> 
Um, and then we'll bring in the chief priest, Alazar Banloya, into the chat. Let's see if he's here. Can you speak Gorilla Hebrew? Yeah, man. How we doing? How we doing? How we sound, Corey? Sounded pretty good. I'll hit the chat if we have any technical issues that the stage may not cover. Um, you guys briefly go through the um, introduction, briefly go through the rule structure. You guys both agree, correct? Yes, sir. All right, good deal. Make sure you cash apping, um, sending your cash apps um, and support for the debaters as well as the moderators and the platform to um, the money sign, the dollar sign, ask Brother Garfield. Spell out brother with the E-R. Don't put the A at the end. Ask Brother Garfield um, to make sure you're supporting the platform. We got a bunch of people in the room. So uh, let's get started here shortly. Um, so firstly, I'll go with a uh, Gorilla Hebrew. A uh, Gorilla Hebrew, if you can take a few minutes uh, to introduce yourself to the people and plug in whatever organizations or systems you may be working with. All right, definitely, man. Well, uh, of course, uh, first and foremost, I'm Chief Priest Alazar Ben Loya, aka um, the Gorilla Hebrew, uh, the Chief Priest of the Sakari Israelite Camp. Um, you know, we're all over the country. If anybody's interested in um, joining, you can always email us, join at sakari.camp. That's S I C A R I I dot camp, C A M P. Um, and, uh, you know, we're just going, you know, through all over the country, preaching this word, all over the world, really preaching this word. And of course, we are um, stepping up in the realm and arena of debates on the highest scholastic levels, um, challenging. Um, you know, PhDs and other uh, academics, scholars, things of that nature on, um, you know, our positions that we hold as far as the biblical text in history. All right. Good deal. Appreciate that, Chief Freese. And uh, we'll bounce it over to Dr. Richard Carrier. Dr. Richard Carrier, if you can introduce yourself to the people and plug in whatever organizations you would like to as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so I have a PhD in ancient history from Columbia University, uh, and I published a postdoctoral study on the historicity of Jesus called On the Historicity of Jesus. Um, but I published a short pot market summary of that called Jesus from Outer Space. Uh, so if you're interested in the, that subject, those are the books to check out. Um, everything else about me, my blog, my social media, my online courses that I teach, uh, if you want to get in on that, uh, my books, uh, you can find all of that at richardcarrier.info. That's just richardcarrier.info uh, online. All that stuff is there. Um, I'm coming at it from a different perspective, obviously. Uh, I'm a skeptic in a lot of ways. I'm a very publicly known atheist. Uh, so I don't believe in any of the supernatural background to this. Um, I find the debate usually is more interesting between uh, whether a mundane historical Jesus existed and was exaggerated over time. Uh, or didn't. Uh, but today, we're uh, going to be debating someone who thinks that Jesus was, I'm assuming, uh, in some sense, supernatural. So we'll see how that uh, breaks out. Um, I'll have more to say uh, in my opening on that, but um, glad to be here and curious to see where this goes. Good deal. Make sure y'all subscribe to the Brother Garfield podcast. Um, you know, it's going to be some great things down here, but let's get right into this. We're going to go into the opening presentation um, section. Uh, Gorilla Hebrew will be going first. Five minutes is your time, Gorilla Hebrew. And uh, I will be chiming in at one minute to let you know it's one minute left. Do you have any questions for me? No, sir. That sounds good. All right. The time will start when you start or when you're prepared to share your screen. All right. Uh, I'll prepare to uh, share my screen. Is it is everything working? It's good. Right. Screen is shared. Okay. All right. Perfect. Well, uh, first and foremost, of course, I've got to give all praises, all honor, and all glory unto the Most High God, whose name in ancient Hebrew is Yahweh. I do so in the name of his only begotten son, whose name in ancient Hebrew is Yahweh Shai, who we will be defending today. Of course, who the world knows again is Jesus Christ, our King, our Lord, you know, our Savior, our Messiah. And um, now that I got that out the way, um, this is the type of energy we coming on tonight. Y'all see the folding chair. Y'all see the shirt. Just so everybody understand the type of energy and spirit I'm coming in tonight. I'm going to need them folding chair emojis in the chat. Y'all better flood that chat with them folding chair emojis before we even get just so y'all know how I'm coming tonight. 
All praise to the Most High. So, as we see here, did Jesus exist? A presentation by Chief Priest Alazar Baloya, aka the Gorilla Hebrew, brought to you through the spirit and power of Yahweh by Hashem Yahweh Shai. Right? Let's go. So, first and foremost, I want to start with the scripture. Second John 1 to 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. And that is the spirit in which we are wrestling with today. The spirit of antichrist, which the scripture told us 2000 years ago, had already came into the world. Right. So it most certainly is my theological position, my belief in the character that we read about in the Bible is Jesus Christ again as my king, as my Messiah, Savior, etc., um, but henceforth, for the rest of this debate, I will, for the most part, be functioning from a scholastic perspective. I won't be really delving into my personal theology or beliefs because the question simply is about the historicity of Jesus. Did Jesus exist? Right. Mm. OK, hold on. All right. So. A lot of us, myself, before this debate, I didn't know Richard Carey. A lot of my audience, we didn't know Richard Carey, Dr. Richard Carey. So I'd like to introduce Richard Carey to everybody tonight. In 2008, Carey received a doctorate in ancient history from Columbia University, where he studied the history of science in antiquity. He is a prominent advocate of the theory that Jesus did not exist, which he, we, which he has argued in a number of his works. Carey's methodology and conclusions in this field have been proven controversial and unconvincing to most ancient historians. Carrier posits that Jesus originated in the realm of mythology rather than a historical person who was subsequently mythologized. A number of critics have rejected Carrier's ideas and methodology, calling it tenuous or very weak or slight or problematic and unpersuasive. Simon Gaither Cole, PhD, professor of the New Testament and early Christianity, director of studies in theology at Cambridge University, the very prestigious, writes that Carrier's arguments are contradicted by historical data. Right? Um, most contemporary scholars have been critical of Carrier's methodology and conclusions. Both classic, classicists and biblical scholars agree that there is, hold on, I can't see my, uh, what's this is blocking it. I paused the time. Appreciate you. Okay, I'm back. Uh, both, both classicist and biblical scholars agree that there is a historical basis for a person called Jesus of Nazareth. For this reason, the views of Carrier and other proponents of the belief that a historical Jesus did not exist are frequently dismissed as fringe theories with classical scholarship. Everything that I just read to you guys is on Dr. Richard Carrier's Wikipedia page. If you ever want to just Google him, you go on his Wikipedia page, everything that I just presented, that's what they have there to let us know about him. So I wanted to just make sure everybody understood that Um about him, right? The Christ myth theory, which is what Dr. Carrier represents, or you know, some version thereof, also known as the Jesus myth theory, Jesus one myth minute theory, left, or the Jesus a history theory, is a view that the story of Jesus is a work of mythology with no historical substantial substantiability. The mainstream scholarly consensus holds that there was a historical Jesus who lived in the first century CE, Roman Judea, and that he was probably both baptized and crucified. Mysticism is rejected as a French theory by virtually all scholars of antiquity and is criticized for commonly being presented by non-experts. Its reliance on arguments from silence, lacking evidence, the dismissal or distortion of sources, questionable methodologies, and outdated comparisons with mythology. Virtually all scholars of antiquity dismiss theories of Jesus' non-existence and regard them as refuted. Right? So I wanted to put all that on the record, how the scholars are talking about Dr. Richard Carrier and how the scholars are talking about this idea that Jesus didn't exist at uh, all. All praises. All right, good deal. That is the that will conclude the opening presentation. Uh, let's see if we can stop sharing this screen right quick. Should be off. That will conclude the opening presentation for uh, Gorilla Hebrew. We'll move over to the opening presentation for Dr. Richard Carrier. Dr. Richard Carrier, are you ready to go? 
Yeah, yeah, I'm ready to go. Um, and, so, uh, are you sharing your screen? Yeah, I'm going to share a screen. Uh, Let me get that up first. Keep me apprised if anything goes wrong on that. <clears throat> I don't see. I don't see your. Uh... I'm getting on there. <laughs> okay, good. Right. Uh, make sure you guys are hitting uh, the cash out for uh, the Good Brother Garfield podcast. That will be dollar sign. Let me get it on. Bring dollar sign. Ask Brother Garfield. Uh, Dr. Richard Carrier's screen should be shared. All the right. time and will start when you start. All right. You can see it. It's all good. Yes. All right. Um, so I'll, I'll get to the rebuttal to uh, what um, what was just said here later uh, when we get to the rebuttals. But let's uh, let's talk about why I'm a skeptic. Um, I'm not going to convince anyone in a debate in a single night. I, you know, I know how that works. Um, I'm actually here just to explain why I doubt why I'm skeptical uh, that Jesus existed. And so you can understand where I'm coming from. So I'm just going to go over some of the basics. And we might come to this screen later, uh, might come up uh, in terms of the timeline. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the timeline of the evidence for Jesus, which is actually quite the opposite of the timeline of evidence we have for any other historical figure that we're confident existed. Uh, and let's get into some details about this. So it's actually an unusual sequence of evidence for Jesus uh, compared to all other historical people, all other people that were confident uh, historically existed. And what happens is our earliest evidence uh, within a few decades of Jesus's supposed life, uh, we have Paul, we have the book of Hebrews, uh, I think first Clement, uh, I think all of these works uh, predate uh, the 60s uh, AD or at least predate 70 AD. Um, they only speak of a pre-existent celestial being and a revealed gospel. They only talk about Jesus revealing himself uh, in, in mystical ways. They don't talk about anyone meeting Jesus before he died. And the first time we hear about that, about people meeting Jesus before he died, was in the gospels. And that's a lifetime later. Uh, back then, average life expectancy was 48 years. Um, and we're talking uh, much longer than that. So after the 70s, uh, the gospels are written between the 70s and 120s AD is when the, the canonical gospels get written in that period. <clears throat> and they are wildly fictional. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that later about how most scholars actually agree with me on this point, uh, that the gospels are not reliable histories. Um, and then all other attestations to the existence of Jesus are based on the gospels or we can't prove that they aren't. Uh, so no other evidence is independent of the gospels. And this is crucial for history if we don't have independent evidence, we can't use it. We need independent corroboration to use it. And even the Gospels, in fact, are like this. All the Gospels uh, basically just use the framework of Mark, the first Gospel, and just build on it and riff on it and add things to it and change things to it. So really, we only have one document that attests the historical Jesus, and that's the Gospel of Mark. And everybody else is just uh, embellishing on that. All the other evidence uh, from the first 80 years of Christianity's development has been completely lost. We have no other letters from this period uh, other than the ones that I mentioned. We have no other idea of what was going on, who thought what, who was arguing what, and so on. And at the same time, as that century goes on and the next century proceeds, other evidence is forged in its place. We have dozens of other Gospels, dozens of Acts, dozens of Epistles, actually hundreds of Doctored Epistles, and even doctored passages. So there's a lot of editing, fabricating of evidence. So this is not a great situation to be in when you're trying to establish the historical existence of someone is when people are fabricating a lot of things about them. Uh, and for people who wanna compare Jesus to actual historical figures like Spartacus or Hannibal and so forth, uh, Pontius Pilate even, uh, I talk about that in chapter five of my book, Jesus from Outer Space. So you can get all of that there. But the point being is that the evidence for Jesus follows a completely different trajectory than everybody else that we're confident of the historicity. Some other things we know. Uh, we know that Jews identified a character in the Old Testament as the Lord, God's firstborn son, first created being, and the creator himself. Uh, God assigned him the task of creating. Uh, also the celestial high priest of God's uh, heavenly temple. And we have uh, lots of evidence regarding this, that this was already a belief in Judaism at the time. And we can show that Paul, certainly through Paul, is our earliest source on the history of Jesus. Christians thought their Jesus, God's Savior, which is uh, what his name essentially means, uh, was that this archangel descended, became incarnate, took on flesh, and was killed and resurrected and in order to accomplish a very important uh, part of God's plan for salvation for everybody. One this, minute left. This is very in parallel to Satan's cosmic story. Uh, these events were hidden in scripture and revealed 
uh, and it just reverses the fall of Satan. So just as Satan is not in there uh, historically, but people believed he was, same with Jesus, you can find examples in Islam, Mormonism, and so on uh, to paint that. And the other thing is that the uh, Jesus story is a copy, not a direct copy, but is an emulation, a Jewish version of these savior gods. So we have tons of examples uh, on the screen that you can see here. They are all savior gods. They're all the son of God or daughter. They all undergo a passion, uh, some sort of suffering or struggle, even death sometimes. Uh, they all obtain victory over death, which they share with their followers. Uh, often they share it with baptism and communion. These things predate Christianity and were part of pagan cult before that. Their stories are all set in human history, yet none of them ever really existed. So what we really need to establish is that somehow, for some reason, that Jesus is an exception to all these other gods that have the same trajectory and the same story arc. And uh, I think that's uh, unlikely, uh, unless we had good evidence, and we just don't. So uh, that's what we'll debate today. All right, make sure you guys are subscribed to the Brother Garfield podcast. Make sure you hit that cash app. Uh, dollar sign ask brother garfield um and send your support for the debaters and the platform as well as the moderators um we've just concluded the opening presentation we will go into the first round which the time will be set at 15 minutes um i will still sound off at one minute when it's one minute left um gorilla hebrew are you prepared yeah i'm ready all right, would you be sharing your screen? Yes, sir. Let me get it uh, up on the screen. Uh, should I tap on that same screen? That oh, got? yes, sir. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll add it back to the stream. All right, we should be good to go. So the time will start. This is the first round, 15 minutes, and then we'll go right after that with Dr. Richard Carey's 15 minutes. The time will start when you start, Gorilla Hebrew. All right, again, first and foremost, I give all praises to the Most High, Yahweh, in the name of His Son, Yahweh Shai. So I want to go here. Um, according to New Testament scholar James Dunn, who's Ph.D. in Biblical Studies at Cambridge, nearly all modern scholars consider the baptism of Jesus and his crucifixion to be historically certain. He states that these two facts in the life of Jesus command almost universal assent and rank so high on the almost impossible to doubt or deny scale of historical facts. And they are obvious starting points for an attempt to clarify the what and why of Jesus mission. Right. So, again, leading scholars, again, in classicism, in biblical studies, etc., are all telling you that it is truly absurd to deny that Jesus existed historically. Right. Historian Dr. Michael Grant, also of Cambridge. We're talking about Cambridge College. Now, Kerry, he went to Columbia. Let's not act like that's not prestigious, but we're talking about Cambridge. We did Cambridge, Oxford, Harvard. These are the elite academic institutions on the face of the earth, right? Argues, above all, if we apply to the New Testament as we should, the same sort of criteria as we should apply to other ancient writings containing historical material. We can no more reject Jesus' existence than we can reject the existence of a ma of mass uh, of a mass of pagan personages whose reality as historical figures is never questioned, ever questioned. Right? It is already redundantly and abundantly clear that the position of my opponent, his arguments, his methodology, etc., are viewed as less than credible at best by his colleagues, fellow. PhD scholars, right? So now let's go get into some of the sources that attest to the life and the existence in history of Jesus Christ. We're going first, of course, to the annals of Cornelius Tacitus. Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, pro Pontius Pilate. So here we see the Christians being attested to, the man Christ being attested to, and his crucifixion under Pilate, another historical figure. So he's being placed in history, and an actual historical event is being described and chronicled as occurring to him, referenced as actually happening to him by history. 
Most scholars hold the passage to be authentic and that Tacitus was the author. Suggestions that the passage may have been a complete forgery have been generally rejected by scholars. Scholars such as Bruce Chilton, Craig Evans, Paul Eddy, and George Boyd agree with John Mary, uh, Myers' rather, statement that despite some feeble attempts to show that this text is a Christian interpolation in Tacitus, the passage is obviously genuine. Right now, let's go to Josephus. Not a Christian, but a Jew, right? It's important here that we're using non-Christian sources. Why is it important that we use non-Christian or secular sources? Well, simply because they don't have a dog in the fight. They don't have a motivation or this conviction or belief to try to manufacture Jesus' existence. It's not um, pertinent to their salvation in their mind, right? So now let's go to Josephus. Around this time lived Jesus, a wise man, for he was a worker of amazing deeds and was a teacher of the people who gladly accept the truth. He won over both many Jews and many Greeks. Pilate, when he heard him accused by the leading men among us, condemned him to the cross. But those who had first loved him did not cease doing so. To this day, the tribe of Christians named after him has not disappeared. So here we have a Jewish scholar, a Jewish historian who's very dependable on understanding history of the region at the time. Right. We have him attesting to and affirming Christ's existence, Jesus existence and the crucifixion. Right now, y'all, let's meet Dr. Michael Brown. You may remember I had a debate with him a few months back. He is wild. He is widely rather considered the world's foremost messianic Jewish apologist. He wrote a book called Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus. In volume four, he brings some very interesting points up. He says there are some definite references to Jesus in the Talmud, always spelled Yeshu, most prominently the following account. On the eve of Passover, they hanged Jesus, the Nazarene. A herald went out before him for 40 days saying he is going to be stoned because he practiced sorcery and led Israel astray. Excuse me. And anyone who knows anything in his favor, let him come and plead in his behalf. But not having found anything in his favor, they hanged him on the eve of Passover. Right. So before I even go to my next slide, let me just build on this. We clearly have these are Jewish people right in the Talmud attesting to the crucifixion on the Passover, the date in which the New Testament corroborates its occurrence. Now, we know that the Jewish people are against Jesus, right? The Talmudic, especially the rabbinical Jews, are against Jesus. They don't want people to follow Jesus, etc. cetera. Um, but here they are affirming that he existed. Let's continue on. Also of significance to traditional Jews, despite its late date, is the testimony of Moses Mammonitis. In its original form, before being edited because of Catholic Church censors, Mammonitis in his law code speaks of Jesus of Nazareth, who aspired to be the Messiah and was executed by the court. Going on to explain why he could not be the Messiah, but how despite the false nature of their teachings, Christianity and Islam would still help prepare the world for the knowledge of the one true God. For a religious Jew, this settles the question. Since both the Talmud and Mammonitis state clearly that Jesus lived and was put to death. In fact, for a traditional Jew, the existence of Jesus has never been questioned. It's very important to note that a traditional Jew has never questioned the actual existence, the historicity of Jesus. And I'll explain why. We have to ask ourselves, why would rabbinic Jews, firm opponents of Christianity, not utilize the argument that he never existed if he, in fact, never existed. And who would know better than the people from the place in which he was said to exist, right? When you read in the New Testament, he stays in Jewry, right? He ventures to Samaria a little bit, ventures to Edom, but for the most part, he is in Judea proper and Galilee amongst the Jews all of his entire life. Right. So if anybody was to have the knowledge that this was a fictitious character, a mythological character, a character that did not exist, it would be the Jews who were adamantly and vehemently opposed to following him. Yet they never once questioned his existence. I'll give you all an example. If Michael Jordan never existed, 
Wouldn't that be the primary argument proponents of LeBron James would use in conversations about who the best basketball player ever was? LeBron would be the obvious choice because said competition never actually existed. That would be the same argument Jews would use if Jesus hadn't actually existed. But they don't. Instead, they acknowledge his existence in history through and through. Right. So if we're having this goat debate which our people always love having that GOAT talk. Who was the GOAT? Was it Michael? Was it Jordan? Was it Kobe? If Michael Jordan never existed, all I would have to say to say LeBron is the GOAT is he's not even real, right? If Jews didn't want other Jews to convert and follow Christianity, all they had to do was remind the other Jews, hey, this guy wasn't real. There was none of us who went through any of this, right? But that never happens. They only engage Jesus in history as if he actually existed. And for a fun fact, Larry Bird once called Michael Jordan God. He said, I would never have played, I would never have called him the greatest player I'd ever seen if I didn't mean it. Bird told the Boston Globe. He said, it's just God disguised as Michael Jordan. So here we have Michael Jordan, somebody who we know is indefinitely a historical character. And we see him mythologized by an opponent of his who calls him God, interestingly enough. But Dr. Richard Carrier employs this type of mythalization to discredit somebody's actual existence. But here we have somebody we know existed, and we see their mythalization. Let's continue on. Marab Bar Serapion was a Stoic philosopher from the Roman province of Syria. He is noted for a letter he wrote in Aramaic to his son, who was named Serapion. Most scholars dated shortly after 73 AD during the first century. He said, what advantage did the uh, Athenians gain from murdering Socrates? Famine and plague came upon them as a punishment for their crime. What advantage did the men of Samos gain for burning Pythagoras? In a moment, their land was covered with sand. What advantage did the Jews gain from executing their wise king? It was just after that that their kingdom was abolished. God justly avenged these three wise men. The Athenians died of hunger. The Samians were overwhelmed by the sea and the Jews desolate and driven from their own kingdom, living complete dispersion. But Socrates is not dead because of Plato. Neither is Pythagoras because of the statue of Juno, nor the wise king because of the new law he laid down. Now, granted, it doesn't say the name of Jesus verbatim there, but we know in the New Testament, Jesus is referred to and or recognized as a king by the Jews, Christians and Roman mockers. See John 6, 15, Acts 17 to 7 and John 19 and 19. Outside of Jesus, there is no reference to the execution of any Jewish king in antiquity. Also, the writer is directly associating the execution of the king with the diaspora, i.e. Jesus, just a few decades before the Jewish Roman War that left Jewry much dispersed just a few years prior to this letter being written. And finally, what other king brought a new law or way of life to the Jews that was met with the objection described here? Furthermore, let's meet Pythagoras. No authentic writings of Pythagoras have survived. Almost nothing is known for certain about his life. The earliest sources on Pythagoras' life are brief, ambiguous, and often satirical. Three ancient biographies of Pythagoras have survived from late antiquity, all of which are filled primarily with myths and legends. Yet no one questions his existence. Meet Socrates, a Greek philosopher from Athens, who is credited as the founder of Western philosophy and among the first moral philosopher, philosophers of the ethical tradition of thought. Socrates authored no text and is known mainly through posthumanist accounts of classical writers, particularly st his students, Plato and Xenophon. Right. Contradictory accounts of Socrates make a reconstruction of his philosophy nearly impossible, a situation known as the Socratic problem. An important historical figure who has only evidence for existence is the writings of a few of his followers, primarily only two, who was sentenced to death, yet his historicity is never called into question. And Mara Bon Sar Sarpion mentions him alongside Pythagoras and Jesus speaking to the ancient viewpoint that these were real people in history. This is a clear position that is being held by these individuals, right? Or else why would he talk about all three of them, name them sequentially, and talk about the consequences on the places in which they lived as a result of their deaths or their people, their citizens turning on them, 
right? He wouldn't do that if he did not understand these people to be real people. And again, this is a first century witness. If we go back to the source, it says what? Mar Bansarapan was a Stoic philosopher, right? He is noted for a letter he wrote in Aramaic to his son who was named Serapon. Most scholars date it to shortly after 73 AD. So when understanding these things, the same exact objections that lead Dr. Richard Carrier to the rejection of Jesus Christ as a historical figure exists for Pythagoras. There's even less evidence for Pythagoras. Similar objections exist for Socrates. But again, why does nobody ever reciprocate this energy for the Pythagoras of the world or the Socrates of the world? This is the question we have to ask ourselves. Why is all of this attention and energy always dedicated, directed at the historical Jesus, right? There has to be some reason why he's always calling the question. Again, now, Carrier's going to go to the myth. But again, right here, three ancient biographies of Pythagoras have survived from late antiquity, all of which are filled primarily with myths and legends. One minute left. All. Oh. Again, where is this energy for Pythagoras? We have to ask ourselves these things. Again, I want everybody to remember that the bulk, the, 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 the overwhelming majority, the scholastic consensus is that Jesus Christ, who the world knows as Jesus Christ, who we, of course, know as Yahweh Shai, was indeed a historical figure, and he existed. With that, I yield the rest of my time giving all praises to Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shai. All right, good deal. Uh, really, Hebrew uh, concludes the rest of his time. I'll stop that and reset. All right, and we'll be going and standing or uh, remaining in the first round and going over to Dr. Richard Carrier's 15 minute round. The time is reset. We'll stop Gorilla Hebrew from sharing. Uh, Dr. Richard Carrier, are you prepared and are, are you going to share your screen? Uh, no, I won't bother sharing. I might share my screen later, but. I don't need to for the rebuttal. All right, good deal. I'll I'll, I'll be prepared when you do. Um, okay. uh, the time is set, so the time will start when you start. All right. Um, <clears throat> well, let's start with uh, if we're going to have this argument from scholars. Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, Gorilla Hebrew's position is also unconvincing to most historians. It's rejected as a fringe theory by almost all scholars, etc. The mainstream position, most of these scholars by far uh, that he could cite uh, on the defense of hist historicity of Jesus, believe that Jesus was not a supernatural person, that he wasn't resurrected from the dead, he didn't perform any miracles, uh, and that most of the stories told about him are false. Uh, this is the mainstream view of most historians. So if we're gonna cite what most historians, if we're gonna use that as an argument, that what most historians regard as true is true, uh, then Christianity is out. Uh, the historical Jesus of the supernatural Jesus, that, that idea is not accepted. Uh, by mainstream scholars. So, so if we're gonna use that argument, that doesn't really help uh, if your goal is to try and rescue all of the mythological stories about Jesus. Uh, the most scholars think that those are myths about Jesus. So uh, the, the credible version of Jesus is a Jesus who was believed that he was some sort of prophet, but he failed, uh, his prophecies didn't come true, and then his faithful followers uh, aggrandized him and exaggerated his, his feats and achievements and so on. And then myths and legends grew over time. Uh, that is the mainstream view. That is what most scholars think happened. Uh, now, I actually think that we shouldn't be using arguments from authority like this. We shouldn't just be saying what most people think or whatever. Uh, we should be looking at the evidence. So uh, I think that's actually more important uh, is what is the evidence? If those of you who are interested in the question of how uh, respected is the doubting of Jesus altogether, even the mundane uh, mainstream historical Jesus, uh, I have a list of over 40 scholars now who think it's at least respectable to doubt uh, the historicity of Jesus, whether they do or not. Um, and that's a list of historians who think doubting historicity is plausible. You can find that on my blog at richardcarrier.info. But let's get to the evidence. Um, and I'll go in order, because uh, I'm following the notes as I wrote them. Uh, there could be a more logical order than this, but we'll follow the, the chronological order uh, as they were presented. Um, <clears throat> the baptism by John thing. Uh, the, yeah, a lot of scholars think that that is true. The problem is, is that that's not in Paul. Paul never mentions any relation to the Baptist cult, no competition with the Baptist cult or anything like that. So there's no connection in our earliest sources. And in fact, it only appears 
in Mark. And all the other versions of this story are just copies and rewrites uh, and edits of Mark's story. So we only have one source. We don't know who Mark is. Uh, we can't establish that he had any sources that would be relevant to this. Uh, so this is a really bad source uh, from a historical perspective. It's terrible. It's also too convenient to invent. Uh, that It's very convenient for the Christians to claim that John the Baptist, this great famous hero of yore, uh, to claim that he declared Jesus to be his successor and superior. That, that's too, too convenient. Uh, that's the kind of thing to be thrown out of court as unbelievable uh, hearsay. Uh, so we don't have any actual eyewitness to this that John the Baptist ever said any of this, that any of this really happened. So it, this is really bad evidence when it comes to historicity. Uh, I don't think that can be established. Uh, I think the crucifixion is better uh, because that at least is attested widely. Uh, you know, Paul talks about the crucifixion of Jesus often. The only problem is that Paul doesn't say where it happened or who did it. Uh, and this is a bigger problem uh, because as was cited just now, uh, the, the Jews of the Talmud, who this is the Babylonian Talmud, so they're writing outside the Roman Empire uh, in, in Mesopotamian region. Uh, those Jews, their Jesus, as far as they know, the Jesus they're talking about, wasn't crucified. Uh, he was stoned to death uh, by a legal court of the Jews, the Sanhedrin. The Romans weren't even there. This took place, according to the Talmud, 100 years earlier. So they don't even put Jesus in the same part, period of history. Uh, so they've got him 100 years earlier, before the Romans are even there. Uh, they have him stoned, not crucified. Uh, and they have him killed somewhere else, that not in Jerusalem. So this, if you're going to trust that, you're saying like, well, okay, if the Jewish sources are that reliable, uh, how could they get all of that wrong? How could they get it 100 years off? Uh, how could they get wrong how he was killed? He wasn't crucified. He was stoned. Uh, these are serious problems with the evidence. And it shows that we can't trust this evidence because it's too late. And the people talking about these things don't have any reliable sources and they have no way to check them. So by the time we hear in the Talmud, uh, Jesus has ended up in a different period of history. His execution is completely different and so on. Uh, this is the kind of thing we're talking about. Uh, this doesn't fit. When we look at other historical people, and we'll get to, hopefully I'll have time for Pythagoras and Socrates. Well, Socrates mainly. Um, that isn't what we see. We see a very different pattern of evidence. With Jesus, we see this really messed up pattern of evidence that suggests that we're talking about a mythical person that people really didn't know any historical facts about, really. Uh, and this is another example when we're talking about Michael Grant, the quote of Michael Grant. That's decades ago. Uh, I have to point out that the field has hugely moved on since Grant's time. Uh, skepticism of the reliability of the Gospels and things like that is hugely increased. It's much more mainstream. Uh, I have a lot of examples on my blog. Uh, Robin Faith Walsh has written one of the, the latest studies on this. Um, we don't trust uh, that the Gospels are telling us the truth in the way that Michael Grant did. Uh, and so things have changed, basically. So we, we've gotten more skeptical. We've gotten more attentive to the evidence and less dogmatic about it. Uh, and that's the kind of claim that I've challenged with my academic study. So kind of, kind of the point of my study is to take claims by Grant, which were not based on any evidence, and show that, that, they, that, 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 uh, you know, that sort of confidence that Grant showed. Is, it doesn't hold up uh, when you look at the evidence. The evidence is way weaker than it is for people like Socrates, for example. And... Let me briefly do that. I'm going to skip ahead and do Socrates and I'll hop back. Um, so uh, I mentioned Pythagoras. Actually, uh, Pythagoras' historicity is, is doubted. Scholars are not that confident in the historicity of Pythagoras because they're aware that we have very bad evidence. Um, as it happens, though, we have some casual mentions of him in his own lifetime or near his own lifetime from people who weren't interested in promoting his mythology. Uh, and that's the kind of thing we don't have for Jesus. Uh, this is even clearer for Socrates. Now, Socrates, we have really good evidence. If we had the evidence for Socrates, that we, for, if we had the evidence for that, for Jesus, this wouldn't even be a debate. I would be on, uh, on the other side of this. I'd be like definitely arguing for the historicity of Jesus. But we don't, and that's the weird thing. Uh, Socrates, we have, we have several eyewitness sources, not just his two disciples. We have no disciples writing about Jesus. None of the gospels are written by uh, the disciples, they don't claim to be written by the disciples. They don't they claim to be written by witnesses. They don't even mention having witnesses. Uh, when you get to the Gospel of John, the last redaction of John, which is in the late or the, the early second century, mid second century, mentions an anonymous source that we don't believe is true. Uh, but no one else actually cites witnesses and says, I got this information from so-and-so, or I was there or anything like that. We don't get any of that uh, from the Gospels. And that's why mainstream scholars place the Gospels fairly late, uh, between the 70s and the early 120s AD, uh, and they're written by people. We don't know who they are. We don't know what their sources are. They're writing in a foreign language in a foreign land. They're not even writing in the native language where Jesus lived and taught. 
But when we get to Socrates, we have all that. We have native language. We have people who were there. Uh, we have eyewitnesses. We even have as critics, uh, and really important, The Clouds of Aristophanes is a play that was performed with Socrates in the audience. That's how contemporary that was. Uh, that makes fun of Socrates. It kind of pokes fun at his philosophy and teachings and, and person and so on. Uh, if we had that for Jesus, that'd be amazing. We would know a lot more about Jesus if we had critics of Jesus talking about him who actually knew him and met him and stuff like that. We don't have that. So we have all of this evidence for Socrates. And that's why we have a lot more, by the way. I have a whole section on Socrates in my book on the historicity of Jesus. I'm just giving you a quick summary of the best stuff we've got. We have tons of evidence for Socrates that we don't have for Jesus. And that's why I pointed out in my presentation the evidence for Jesus goes the other direction. It's very strange. It starts out about he's a revelatory being and stuff. We get myths only later. We don't have contemporary discussions of him. Uh, we certainly don't have contemporary discussions from eyewitnesses or critics or anything like that. Uh, so Socrates, that's why we're confident Socrates existed. And I could totally defend the historicity of Socrates. But we don't have any of this evidence. The evidence that convinces us that Socrates existed, we don't have that for Jesus. And that's the reason why uh, we act, should react differently to this. Um, so let's get back. Um, <clears throat> so um, did that. Okay, so historians have a rule. This is this is fundamental in the field. Uh, you know, it's one of like your first year of grad school. You can't cite evidence that is just copying other sources, right? So if, if someone just repeats what another source said, they are not corroborating that source. They're just repeating it. Uh, so we can't use that as corroboration. We need corroborating sources. We need independent sources, not dependent sources. It's very crucial. And this is why we can't use sources like Moses Maimonides. Maimonides, Maimonides sorry, I uh, apologize. Um, he's a medieval author, right? This is like a thousand years later. Uh, he has no access to the original evidence. He has nothing to go on other than the stories told to him by other Jews and Christians and stuff that have circulated through centuries and centuries, mostly through the Gospels and the influence of the Gospels. Um, so he's not usable as evidence for this. He's just repeating stories that he's told that go back to the Gospels, which just go back to Mark, which postdates Paul by decades. So uh, this is this is bad evidence. We can't use that uh, to corroborate Mark uh, in, in those details. Same with Mara Bar Serapion. Actually, uh, scholars agree that we can't establish the date of Mara Bar Serapion. It's dated anywhere from the late first century to the early third century. Um, that's a huge span of time. Since we can't date it, uh, we can't establish that it's not just repeating what, it, what who this author learned from the Gospels. So it's not independent. It's not an independent source, so we cannot use it to corroborate the Gospels. It's useless as evidence for this purpose. The same goes for Tacitus. Um, and I'm not even going to argue here whether it's an interpolation. Uh, people who are interested in that can find my work elsewhere uh, on why we doubt uh, Tacitus or Josephus actually mentioned Jesus. But let's just assume they, they wrote exactly what we have without any difference. Um, let's assume that. Tacitus wrote in 116 AD, uh, and that was decades after the Gospels were already circulating. We also know, just six years before, his best friend, Pliny the Younger, had just interrogated Christians and, and says that he just then learned what Christians preached. And we know that Pliny and Tacitus are best buds. They shared information a lot for Tacitus' histories. We have letters, correspondence between them. Uh, so we know that's probably where Tacitus got his information was from Pliny. Pliny got it from Christians. And this is the early second century. Christians are just repeating at him the Gospels. We can't establish that they did any kind of fact-checking independently of that. Uh, there's no indication that they did. Pliny didn't do it. Uh, and Tacitus gives us no indication that he did either. So all Tacitus is doing at best is just repeating what Christians were telling people and thus what they were getting out of the Gospels uh, decades and decades later, several lifetimes after the fact. Same with Josephus. Uh, Josephus is even more clear. Uh, J.G. Goldberg is a scholar who did a really important paper proving that the passage that was quoted just earlier uh, from Josephus actually is just a slavish paraphrase of the Emmaus speech in Luke 24. So whoever wrote that paragraph, let's assume it's Josephus, uh, whoever wrote that was just copying uncritically the Gospel of Luke. And Gospel of Luke was just embellishing the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, and Matthew was just embellishing the Gospel of Mark. It just goes back to Mark. So this is not an independent source. There's no indication that Josephus had any other sources uh, that he used. So we can't use this evidence. It's not usable to establish the historicity of someone. We're stuck with the Gospels. That's all we've got. And really, that means just one Gospel, which is the Gospel of Mark. I already talked about the, the Talmud uh, placing Jesus 100 years before Pontius Pilate and all of that. Um, <clears throat> we have no information from Jews until hundreds of years after the fact, by the way. Um, when those Jews at that time, we're talking about the Talmud, obviously, 
had no good information. I mean, they clearly couldn't even get the correct century that Jesus existed in. They didn't even know about Pontius Pilate. They didn't know about the Romans or any of that stuff. So clearly this is too late for them to know the truth or get any accurate information by. But when you look at the earliest texts we have, we have Justin Martyr. Now, Justin Martyr invents a fictional Jew to argue with, but his objective was to create a, a story that he could sell to other Jews. So he's trying to uh, model what Jewish critics of his time would represent. And, and the, the Jewish uh, model that he creates in this actually does threaten Christians with saying, well, you guys just believe in myths without any evidence, with no basis in evidence. Uh, you, you just invented a Christ for yourself. And uh, Justin's response to this is to repeat appeal to their miracle working and ability to cast out demons and heal people and stuff like this. It proves there must be a real Jesus. Um, that's not a valid, it's not a logically valid argument, but that's what convinced Justin. But this shows that Jews were challenging it and they couldn't go back and check. They couldn't confirm Jesus didn't exist. There's no way to time travel back a hundred years and check this stuff. They, they didn't have newspapers. They didn't have photographs. They didn't have video. They didn't have the kind of evidence that we have today for like modern sports stars, for instance. We, we, if we had that kind of evidence for Jesus, this would be no, no, uh, no debate at all. But um, we don't. Uh, and they didn't. They didn't have that evidence either. So there's no way for Jews, even in the second century, to know what was true. And so by, you know, get several centuries later, there's definitely no way. So that's not usable as evidence either. And the real sticker here is that we have, we know there were Christians, Christians, faithful believing Christians who didn't think Jesus existed. Uh, we have evidence of this in Second Peter and in Ignatius. And for this, I do think I will try to bring up um, my, see if I can find it real quick here. Here it is, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna bring up a screen. Let me know if this comes One minute through. left. One minute? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, did that work? Hold on. It's not working. I don't see a screen for you yet. I'll pause the time. Okay. Let's go to window. We go here. Thank you. Uh, here we go. Is it showing? It's showing now. Yeah. Second Peter. We did not follow cleverly devised myths. This is the exact same thing that Justin was defending himself against a, a fictional Jew's accusation. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And then this, this text immediately forges an eyewitness account of meeting Jesus. And scholars agree Second Peter is a forgery. It wasn't even written by the same author as First Peter. And he did this to answer otherwise unknown Christians who were claiming such a Jesus, the Jesus that people claim to have met in person, was a cleverly devised myth. So we know there were Christians arguing this. And we get this in the Ignatian Creed. He says, stop your ears when anyone, and he's talking about fellow Christians that they're supposed to be shunned, Stop your ears when anyone speaks to you at variance with the Jesus Christ who was descended from David. He, this is a very crucial thing. He changes the vocabulary of Paul to say descended from David and came through Mary and really was born and ate and drank and really was persecuted under Pontius Pilate, who really was crucified uh, and died in the sight of witnesses in heaven and on earth and so on. So uh, his argument here is that showing that there were Christians who were saying that these were mythologies that carry uh, deeper meaning. Uh, okay, uh, that's a good enough uh, ring up for that. Let me see if I can get out of there. Yeah. Good deal. There Shout out to the Brother Garfield um, podcast. Make sure y'all subscribe to the platform. The topic is, did Jesus exist? That concludes the first round. We'll be going into the second round with the same set of instructions. Gorilla Hebrew will be going first, 15 minutes. Uh, Dr. Richard Carey will follow with 15 minutes. And then we will have five minutes rebuttal and then a five minute rebuttal on the opposite end. Um, oh, well, right now we're still in a, uh, in the first round, correct? We're still in the first round, correct? Yes, rebuttal. So have, right, so we got a rebuttal section, Salakia. So we got a rebuttal section. Gorilla, you'll be going up first for five minutes. I got you time right now. And I'll be calling it at one minute. Are you prepared, Gorilla Hebrew? Would you be sharing the screen? Yes, sir, and I'll be sharing the screen. All right, so let me go ahead and get you set. Uh, would you like for me to click on the same link for the screen? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, you are on the screen. The time will start when you start. Make sure you all uh, uh, send your support, financial support to uh, dollar sign Ask Brother Garfield. Make sure you all send your support to dollar sign Ask Brother Garfield. The floor is yours, Gorilla Hero. All right, again, first and foremost, I give all praises, honor, and glory to you. How about Shemel Shai? So, one major thing I want to point out is how dishonest um, it is, and I'm not 
saying this personally on the behalf of Dr. Richard Carrier, but just in general for um, scholars to dismiss the evidence that exists um, or the lack thereof that exists in Palestine or Judea during the time contemporary with when Christ is purported to walk the earth. And what I mean by that is, of course, we all know the saying, the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. We're talking about somebody who lived in the first century in Judea. So that's a long time ago, right? Not many things are preserved, especially when we're dealing with writings from all over the entire planet from anywhere at that time, let alone a place that was sacked and destroyed by the Romans in the Roman Jewish wars. Then had another Rose Jewish war. Then you had the Barcova revolt. You had various things that totally devastated the area. So it's, and on top of that, the average person, especially peasant, which, of course, Jesus is purported to be, um, had no impact. And there's no evidence that they exist. They didn't leave any evidence behind that they ever existed. The average person who lived at that time, let alone from that region. Those are things that have to be understood um, to act as if such things should exist is really kind of insane. Right. On top of that, he attacked and built a straw man for my argumentation for bringing the Jewish sources, right? Again, I mentioned Mammonitis, or however you say his name, who existed much later in time, of course, than Jesus. The point was the Jewish rabbinical tradition did not assert or affirm that Jesus Christ did not exist. They engaged him as if he was an actual historical figure. So we have to take things into consideration. The number one opponents of Christianity from its onset were the rabbinical Jews. They are the ones who had a problem with many Jews going and doing something that they felt was against the Torah, was idolatrous. If the man never existed, then the individuals who would have firsthand knowledge would have made that a primary argument against his followers. And because of how we know the the, the, the way in which and the, ser the gravity in which rabbinical tradition is taken, we know that that's something that would have been passed down along with all the other traditions of rabbinical Judaism, right? Now, I want to go back to my slides, right? So he's making quite the assertion about Tacitus' knowledge of Jesus. We just heard him do that. And we have strong historical evidence that contradicts what he says, right? So I'm going to go here, right? This is also from the annals of Tacitus. He says this, I remember hearing my elders say that a certain document was often seen in Piso's hand, which he never made public. This document, his friends, um, uh, Averd was a dispatch from Tiberius containing instructions with uh, regard to Samanic, with, in regard to Samanicus, Piso had intended to produce it before the Senate and thereby convict the emperor. But uh, Sinjanus put him off with empty promises. It was also said that Piso did not die by his own hand, but by of uh, by, by the executioner. I cannot affirm the truth of either story. But I feel sound to not withhold statements made by persons who were still alive in the days of my own youth. Right. So this is important because we see that Tacitus accredits nothing what whatsoever beyond the fact that he had heard certain old men tell certain things. He distinctly refuses to accredit anything else. So this is a source where when Tacitus is getting something. Oh, let me go here. My phone. So here we have a clear example of how Tacitus handles hearsay. He affirms that he has no proof beyond uh, what he heard, right? If Dr. Carrier's position were accurate as the Tacitus source for the, life and for the life and crucifixion, he would have said something similar, but he doesn't. He speaks about it as if he knows it matter-of-factly. Again, he is confronted with things that he hears. Oh, it said this. I heard certain old men say this, but he's not verifying it. Or as the other author says, he's not accrediting it because he has no other sources. So he makes sure to mention there is a lack of historical source. In the case of Jesus Christ and his crucifixion under Pontius Pilate, he does no such thing, which means he's speaking matter of factly about it. He's speaking as if it is a validated form of history. And he is, of course, a Roman historian right with that i rest giving again all praise y'all by shimmy i shot make sure you guys are subscribed and following the uh, brother garfield podcast uh, we are locked in on gorilla hebrew verse dr richard carrier did jesus exist we are still in the first round 
It is on Dr. Richard Carrier's five minute rebuttal round. I will reset the time. The time is now reset. I will stop sharing uh, Gorilla's stream. Dr. Richard Carrier, would you like to share a screen for this round? No, I'll just speak. All right, good deal. The five minute rebuttal will start when you start. All right. Yeah. Uh, so the issue that in this debate is not about just the absence of evidence. Uh, that's not what I argued at the beginning. Uh, if you remember, it's the sequence of evidence that is indicative, not just the absence of evidence. The evidence starts with Jesus only being met in revelations and mystical experiences in our earliest documents. No mention of him being someone that people met before he died. And he's only learned through revelation, or learned about through revelation in scripture. It's only a lifetime later that we get sources talking about him being a historical person. And those sources are in a foreign language, in a foreign land, citing no sources. Uh, and we don't know who they are. We don't know where they're getting their information. And the information that they convey is patently mythical. Uh, it looks exactly like the mythologies we have of all the other de deities and demigods and, and heroic persons of the time. So that sequence of events looks like someone who doesn't exist. Where if we look at Socrates, we get multiple contemporaries and people who knew him personally including uh, people who are critics of Socrates. There's even more evidence within this, by the way. There's historians of his own time, other people mention him, uh, even just casually. So we have a lot of a citation to the existence of Socrates. And uh, like I said, it says, you can find this in my book on the history of the city of Jesus. We have none of that for Jesus. Uh, Jesus starts out instead in contemporaries or near contemporaries as a revelatory being, someone people only meet in mystical experiences. It's only decades later, right, that we get the Gospels. And we only get one Gospel, by the way, Mark. And then all the other Gospels are just copying Mark in different ways and adding and embellishing to it. And that looks like similar things that we have for other mythical heroes. Jesus is actually more like Osiris, Hercules, Bacchus, the ones that I mentioned earlier. He looks like one of these savior figures, these savior heroes that people you know, put their faith in and try to obtain immortal, eternal life from. Personal salvation. Uh, all of these gods offered that in the particular uh, religions of the time, uh, including through baptism and communal meals and things like that. Uh, all of these savior figures are usually mythical. Uh, so we need better evidence for Jesus than we have for Socrates. And yet we don't even have for Jesus what we have for Socrates. We have nothing, nothing alike. So that's the reason. It's not just the, the silence of the evidence. It's the weird sequence of evidence that, that doesn't match the sequence of evidence for any other historical person that we're confident in. Um, and get back to the Talmudic Jews argument. Uh, you can't argue that they're giving you any reliable information if they can't even get the correct century that Jesus was killed in. They can't even, uh, don't even know about the crucifixion that he's stoned to death for, uh, for wizardry, for sorcery. Um, so this is, this, their story is clearly wildly off book. Uh, so they have no concept of Pontius Pilate. They have no concept of the Romans being involved. Uh, it's hundred years earlier. So uh, they had no reliable information. So you can't cite them. Uh, they clearly don't know what they're talking about at that time and clearly had no access to any reliable information to talk about Jesus. So we can't, the, you, the information is useless. It's just centuries later, wild hearsay. Uh, we can't base anything on, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> so when we get to Tacitus, uh, Tacitus doesn't mention his sources uh, for this, um, but all he does is repeat information that's exactly from the gospels. And whereas we do know, we know for a fact that Tacitus got information and used information for his histories from his best friend Pliny. And we know for a fact his best friend Pliny interrogated Christians. We know for a fact that Pliny knew nothing about Christians until he interrogated them. Uh, and that Pliny didn't fact check them. And once he heard what the Christians had to say, he says, this is a ridiculous superstition, whatever. Uh, and so that's what Tacitus says too. Tacitus repeats almost, uh, not identical words, but very similar. He calls it a, a ridiculous superstition. So Tacitus, almost certainly, the only source that we can track uh, that's likely for Tacitus is Pliny, who's just citing Christians in the second century, who are just would just be repeating the Gospels. So we can't establish that Tacitus is independent of the Gospels. All he's doing is repeating information that's circulating. He, there's no evidence that he researched it, that he confirmed it was true, or anything like that. And that's why we can't yeah. use passages like Tacitus. Um, and I, that's it, actually. I, I've, I've answered all of the claims made so far. All right, good deal. Um, make sure you are locked in and subscribe to the Brother Garfield podcast. I'm putting together these excellent debates for us, um, starting um, with this major debate between Dr. Uh, Richard Carrier, uh, PhD scholar, and Chief Priest um, Alazar Bonloya. 
Uh, it's been an excellent debate so far. We'll be moving into round two. Um, me being the lead moderator, I want to ask for any other moderators to um, try to uh, refuse <clears throat> or try to restrain yourself from eliminating anybody out of the room. Um, this has been a, a excellent debate so far and a free space um, to watch the highest level, level of uh, edification. There's been a lot of people that has um, invested their time in marketing, um, supporting and spreading the news of this debate as well as uh, sending their support in financially for this debate so far. So we wanna make sure that everybody fairly um, is able to see the debate. Um, if you're saying anything that's extremely wild, then of course we should screenshot that and remove you. But other than that, if you just have your opinion on uh, the debaters, the platform, the moderators, it don't matter, let it ride. Um, I just wanna make sure I say that before we go into round two. Um, I will reset at 15 minutes. Um, Gorilla Hebrew, are you ready to go? And would you be able to, um, would you be utilizing the screen? Yes, sir. I'll be sharing my screen. I'm ready. All right. Let me uh, get that up for you first. And it's the same screen, correct? Before I click it. Yes, sir. All right. Good deal. I add that to the stream and make sure you guys, um, everybody that's just coming into the room, uh, please support the platform. Please support the debaters, support the, um, the moderator and the creator of the platform uh, send uh, your cash apps to dollar sign ask brother Garfield send your financial support there we are in round two where uh, hey, I'm sorry Corey one interjection I apologize no no family, family in the chat leave the tomato stuff alone chill out chill out for tonight all right and if they do put a tomato if you're gonna if you're gonna um time them out time them out don't block them for that don't block them for the because y'all blocking everybody that put tomatoes up. You know what I'm saying? Just I don't know what tomatoes mean. I have no idea what it means. I don't care. But just if you're gonna block, don't block them. Just time them out if you got a problem with a tomato or whatever. But and if y'all putting up tomatoes, no need. Just put a comment, family. All right, peace. Good deal. No problem. Um, so uh, we'll start with Gorilla Hebrew. Uh, 15 minutes, then then we'll slide into Dr. Richard Carriers. Uh, 15 minutes, and then we'll go into Gorilla Hebrews five minute rebuttal, and then Dr. Richard Carrier's five minute rebuttal. Um, Gorilla Hebrew round one or oh, round two, Salakia. Uh, the 15 minute section is on you. The time will start when you start. Okay, yeah. So, again, of course, I first and foremost have to give all praise, honor, and glory to you. So, I'm, I'm going back to a previous slide because I let him slide on it the first time he said it, but he, he said it again, right? And they say that his methodology and argumentation was um, problematic, and we're starting to see that. So he keeps affirming, right, um, about the Jewish sources that, oh, he said he was stoned in the timeline, et cetera. But does it say he was stoned? It says on the eve of Passover, they hanged Jesus, right? A herald went out before him 40 days saying he's going to be stoned. But then they end again with they hanged him on the eve of passover right hanged on a tree um crucifixion that's what it is right just for the record so um it's problematic he misrepresents sources as most proponents of the christ myth theory do right so now let's get back into it let's go back to josephus who of course he's also calling in the question the question is are these reports total and complete forgeries or are they embellishments of the actual words of josephus the scholarly consensus, both Jewish and Christian, points to the latter, recognizing that Josephus did, in fact, have something to say about Jesus. The statements largely recognized as authentic are found in Antiquities 2091, right, 200, where he speaks of the high priest Annas bringing Jacob or James, whom he calls the brother of Jesus, called Christ before the Sanhedrin, right? So what's funny is also what he's doing, and let me not get away from this, is He's going, oh, well, that's not real because it just quotes the gospel. Or is it possible that it's corroborating the gospel, right? Just because it is in accordance with the gospel, he's dismissing it, alleging that it has to be just a copy of the gospel. Now, again, do scholars think that the gospels are much later in time? Yes, they do, right? But that doesn't mean that their entire works of fiction, even if you believe they are predominantly works of fiction. We know that there are historical events and characters that are referenced in the Gospels that are outside of Jesus or any of the supernatural beliefs that is necessary for Christianity, i.e. Pontius Pilate, i.e. Herod, 
etc. We know these are people that existed, right? So in understanding those things, just because something is corroborated with the Gospels does not mean it's just copied from the Gospels or it is repeating the Gospels because it is in accordance with the Gospels. That's a logical fallacy. Let's keep going. So wait, Jesus, he has a brother, but he's not real. How does somebody who's not real have a brother? Right? Let's go to Mark 6 and 3, which is the gospel, right? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon? So they talk about his mom, four of his brothers are not his sisters here with him. He got sisters and they were offended at him. Now, right? Since our friend Dr. Dick here has manufactured his own standard of proof by moving the goalpost to only really considering the seven of Paul's epistles as the only authorities from the New Testament, let's see what they have to say about Jesus' brother. But other apostles saw none, Paul says, save James, the Lord's brother. That's Galatians 1 and 19. So since you like Paul so much, let's stay in Paul. Paul on Christ. Romans 15 and 8, he says, now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm promises made unto the fathers. Dr. Carrier claims Paul says Jesus never taught the Jews, that Paul that, that Jesus doesn't, that Paul doesn't mention his ministry, and he doesn't place him in history. The above verse debunks all three points, right? In order to have a ministry, you have to minister. The circumcision is the Jews. You can't minister to the Jews without a ministry to the Jews. <laughs> More Paul on Christ. First Corinthians 11, 23 to 27. For I have received of the Lord, which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me after the same manner also took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is, is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink in remembrance of me. For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whatsoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Paul is clearly referring to the Last Supper, an event. In human history, you know the thing Dr. Carrier says Paul never places Jesus in, which is in actuality the Passover meal. He was crucified on that day, just like the Talmudic historic sources say. More Paul on Christ. Romans 1 and 3, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. This corresponds with Matthew 1, calling him the son of David, as well as giving a genealogy directly linked David. Uh, uh, David to Joseph, the same Joseph Jesus is called the son of in John 1 and 45 and Luke 2 and 48. Galatians 4 and 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. 1 Timothy 6 and 13. I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession first corinthians 15 4 to 6 no hold on let me let me slow it down so now hold on let me go back another one hold on <laughs> just wait a minute right so it says he's made of the seed of a man right again corresponding with the genealogy in lincoln david to joseph and of course joseph being affirmed as his father in john 1 and 45 and luke 2 and 48 then we got galatians 4 that he has a mom okay then we go to 1 Timothy 6 and 13, right? And it said he witnessed a good confession before Pontius Pilate. Another, this is history, right? Now, 1 Corinthians 15, 4 to 6. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas then and of the 12 after that. He was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this day present, but some are falling asleep. Paul references, Paul's reference to 500 people seeing Christ at once makes it apparent that he, he indefinitely is placing Christ in human history on the planet Earth and not in outer space. 
He clearly believes the eyewitness testimony of the men there who he affirms are still alive, inferring he heard their testimony of this event himself. So according to Paul, let's make this straight, because he's saying Paul never does any of this stuff. According to Paul, Jesus was born, had a dad, had a mom, a brother, a ministry to the Jews, ate Passover, went before an established historical figure, Pontius Pilate, died, was buried, then was seen by 500 people at once. But Dr. Rich here says Paul never places him in human history or even believes him to have been a man that walked the earth. <laughs> right? This is highly problematic. <laughs> right? Because again, his entire thesis is hinged on Paul's epistles. And when we go through Paul's epistles and we read these things and we read how he's placing them in history, I mean, we're talking about somebody, he's talking about somebody sitting down and eating a meal. Now, now, when we go to the Last Supper, right, he says, take and eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. So this is something that he did with the 12, right? He passed the bread around, he drank, he's, he's, he's doing this with somebody, with people. And this is an actual event in which Paul is attesting to occurred. Again, these are the things that his theory is hinged upon can exist in Paul, yet it does exist in Paul's epistles. And even if we start to get into the textual criticism of some of Paul's epistles, 1 Corinthians is, is not on that list. This is on the list of things in which he would use and, and agree is authentic as the earliest Christian writings that we have. which is very interesting. And we got to ask ourselves, right? Because I've watched a lot of uh, our friend here, Dr. Richard Carrier's stuff. How is he going to respond to this? I want everybody to just take notes on how to re how he responds to this. Is he just going to casually, nonchalantly dismiss him as he does most things? If you go watch his tape and his footage, that's essentially what he does when he hears something that contradicts what he says. He just nonchalantly goes, oh, well, that means that. Oh, well, we can't really do that. Oh, well, that. What he's not going to do for most of this um, and what he doesn't do in the majority of the debates that he has is actually show and prove any of the actual reasoning behind his nonchalant dismissals of hard hitting facts that are diametrically opposed to the arguments in which that he is making. Right. So I need everybody out there to notate that. So, again, I'm going to run this back. Right. So according to Paul and Paul's epistles, which again, let's go back to the goalposts. Right. Since our friend Dr. Dick here has manufactured his own standard of proof by moving the goalposts to only really considering seven of Paul's epistles as the only authorities from the New Testament. Let's see what they have to say about Jesus brother. Right. And then, of course, we go even further than Jesus brother. Right. So according to Paul. The standard, the primary standard in which Dr. Richard Carrier formulates his argument. Jesus was born, had a dad, a mom, a brother, a ministry to the Jews, ate Passover, went before an established historical figure, Pontius Pilate, died, was buried, then was seen by 500 people at once. But Dr. Rich here says, Paul never places him in human history or even believes him to been a man that walked the earth. Right. Again. So even when we deal with the revelatory nature of Jesus, this reference here in first Corinthians 15 to him being seen by 500 people at one time. Right. So if I wake up one day and I claim to have a dream or I have an imagination or I get off, to do some acid or LSD and have a hallucination. That's something that happens to me, right? 500 people at once. And what's important here is he says of whom the greater part remain. So he's saying the majority of the 500 people are alive. He has firsthand knowledge that they are alive. He's heard this, this infers that he heard this from them and he believes their testimony. Oh, the majority of 500 witnesses that collectively attest to seeing Jesus. Again, 
whether you believe in the supernatural or not, right, there's different ways to explain that. You have a, a whole Muslim alternative theory that there was a switcheroo, right, that Jesus didn't go on a cross that was not crucified, and he still existed after the date of the crucifixion, right? If we employ that here, that would explain how he, uh, he appeared to 500 people. Right. It doesn't have to be revelatory. It doesn't have to be supernatural. There's a practical way in which he could have appeared to 500 people after he seemingly died. What we do know is Paul, again, who you hinge your argumentation on, is attesting to 500 people seeing him at once. The bulk of which he attests to are still alive and are witnesses to this. That's very important. Right. I'm going to hit another point. Right. Of course, he have, here in First Timothy affirms him going before Pilate. Right now, I went over that. This is also important. I want to hit back on this Romans 15 and 8. Now, I say Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision, kind of like how Peter was a minister to the circumcision and Paul was a minister to the Gentiles. Well, what does that mean? Everybody pretty much understands that Paul went to the Gentiles, those are without, he went to the churches in Asia Minor, people who were in the Greco-Roman world and culture and society. Peter specialized in evangelizing people who were in Jewry, people who were Jews, people who attended synagogue and reasoning to them about Jesus, right? Paul's was different, but he was said to go what? To the circumcision. Peter's ministry was to the circumcision, Paul says here what? Christ was a minister of the circumcision. Who's the circumcision? The people who get circumcised the eighth day, which is who? The Jews. But one more time, to be redundant, because it's important. So according to Paul, Jesus was born. It's something you got to do on earth. Had a dad and a mom. Parents, you have that on earth. A brother, you have, a brother, you have that on earth. A ministry to the Jews. Well, the Jews are on earth, so I'd have to be on earth to minister to them. Ate Passover, eating food that happens here on earth in an event that's commemorated on earth. Went before an established historical figure, Pontius Pilate. That happens on earth. Died, was buried. I mean, to get buried literally means to get put in the earth. Then was seen by 500 people at once who were alive during Paul's time. So that has to happen on earth. But Dr. Rich here says Paul never places him in human history or even believes him to be a man that walked the earth with that. You know, the rest of my time giving all praises to Yahweh by Shemiah So with 20 seconds, uh, Gorilla Hebrew yields the rest of his time. Make sure you're subscribed to the Brother Garfield podcast if you just come into the room and support the debaters and the platform by sending uh, um, support and funds to um, dollar sign ask Brother Garfield, tonight's topic is Did Jesus Exist? We are in the second round going into Dr. Richard Carrier's uh, 15 minutes. Um, I would, let me uh, stop, remove his stream. Uh, Dr. Richard Carrier, would you be uh, sharing your screen for this round? No, no, I need to. All right, good deal. So we're set at 15 minutes. The time will start when you start, Dr. Yeah. Okay. So now we're getting into the Christian apologetic side of this, um, where we're deviating from logic, deviating from mainstream scholarship and proper methods in history. Um, give you a point of what I'm example of what I'm talking about. I'm not the one moving the goalposts by accepting that most of Paul's letters are forgeries. Uh, that is actually uh, the mainstream consensus of scholars in the field. Uh, so I'm, and they're correct. There's there's really good evidence for that stylometric evidence and so on. We, we know this is the case that Paul did not write many of those letters. Uh, and I should point out that this is Guerrilla Hebrew's own standard. He led with this, uh, what most mainstream scholars agree. He said, you should follow what they agree. You should ignore the evidence and follow what most scholars uh, say. So if we follow that rule, you should agree with most scholars that half the letters or so of Paul are forgeries, including First Timothy, which is why we can't use that passage as evidence. It's irrelevant because Paul didn't write it. It's not written in his style. It's not even, as far as scholars believe, it wasn't even written in the first century. Uh, so, so unless Gerla Hebrews wants to repudiate his own argument from scholarly consensus, he should accept their conclusion as to forgeries in the Bible. And if he doesn't, then he is the one moving the goalposts, not me. I'm not the one moving the goalposts here. He's the one moving the goalposts around. Uh, and the key thing for the rest of the, what he said there is that when Guerrilla Hebrew presents his case, like all Christian apologists, he leaves out all the evidence that calls his points into question. 
He cherry picks and frames a story. But when you look at the evidence, that story doesn't hold up. And I'll give you, uh, start with a good example. Probably the best one is this minister of circumcision. Okay. That is not what's in the Greek. Uh, Paul wrote Greek. You have to look at the actual original Greek. The Greek does not say minister in the sense of ministrate. It doesn't mean, it's not talking about doing a ministry. It's not talking about preaching. The word is deacon. Uh, it's the Greek underlying word for deacon. It means servant, administrator. Uh, it means someone who performs a service or a function. Uh, and it's usually a subordinate service or function. Uh, it's not preaching. Paul is not here talking about preaching. He doesn't mean, he never mentions Jesus preaching to the Jews at all. Uh, he's talking about Jesus' role in submitting himself to the laws of the circumcision and dying under the law so that he could free everyone from the law. This is, this is his cultic theology of the purpose of the incarnation and death of Jesus. It has nothing to do with Jesus appearing to the Jews and preaching to them. In fact, when we go to look where Paul does talk about that, he actually says, if you look in Romans 10, uh, I think it's verses 14 to 16, thereabouts, Paul outright says that Jesus never preached to the Jews. He says that the only way that Jews could ever know anything that Jesus preached was by the apostles reporting it to the Jews, which means that Jesus only ever preached in visions and revelations to the apostles directly, personally. And they had, to, the apostles, not Jesus, they had to go around earth and around the world and in Jerusalem and so on, and they had to convey the teachings of the Lord. That means that Paul has no knowledge of Jesus doing this. Uh, the only way the Jews could find out about the teachings of Jesus, the only way they could be saved, the only way they could learn the gospel, was through the apostles. Uh, An apostle means one sent. So he's talking about people who received a vision of Jesus in which this imaginary Jesus sent them forth to preach his message. Uh, and this is all we get in Paul. When you look at Romans 15 or Romans 16, verses 25 to 26, Paul says the gospel and kerygma, meaning preaching of Christ, is known only through revelation and scripture. He never mentions a ministry. He never mentions anything like that. Uh, this is why it's weird. This is why I'm very skeptical of that this is what happened, because we only get him ministering and preaching to the Jews and so on a lifetime later in myths written in a foreign language in a foreign land. So uh, it's only when we get to the Gospels that people start making up these stories. And that's all, long after uh, the witnesses would have been dead. When we look at Paul, we look at someone who's actually contemporary. He only knows about revelations and secret messages and scripture and other sources. He never says anyone knew him. And this is a good example is 1 Corinthians 15, uh, which Gorilla Hebrews brought up. Read, read that passage, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 from verse 1 forward. And notice that Paul never mentions anyone knowing Jesus or meeting Jesus before he died. No one sees Jesus before he died. The first time anyone gets to see Jesus or meet him or hear anything about Jesus is from scripture. And then when Jesus appears to Peter by himself uh, after the death, right? So this is the resurrected Jesus appearing to, uh, to Peter. Now, all mainstream scholars agree that there's no way a dead person showed up and talked to Peter. Uh, they know that this is a standard thing that happens across religions in the world of personal religious experiences, inner experiences. doesn't even necessarily have to be a hallucination. Paul is very vague as to what actually the medium was. At the time, they believed that if God's visited you in your dreams, that that was the real God, that you're actually talking to the God. Uh, and so when he says that Jesus appeared to people, he could mean that they just had dreams in which they met Jesus and he told them these things. Uh, but they could have also had waking visions. We know through many religions uh, throughout world history have waking visions like this and have practices for creating ecstasies in which people will get into an altered state of consciousness and have these experiences. Uh, and, and since this happens in all religions, we know it can't be unique. It's not unique to Christianity, so it doesn't support their God any more than any of the other gods or spirits or angels and whatnot that people claim to have seen. And we have this uh, pagan religion has these visions that people have and things like that. We have lots of examples of that. Now, when we get to the one case where Paul says that there was an appearance all at once to uh, all the brethren, uh, notably, pay close attention, and that is the only instance in which Jesus appears en masse to people. That means all the other instances were individual one offs, private experiences that individuals had and then reported later. Only the appearance to all the brethren was their one sudden appearance that Jesus simultaneously appeared to all these people. Now, Paul never tells us what they saw. He doesn't describe it. He doesn't say what it is exactly. But when we look in the book of Acts, we find when Paul talks, when Paul is, Paul's vision is described in the book of Acts, it's an amorphous light in the sky and a mysterious voice in his head. Uh, it's not meeting a flesh and blood Jesus. And Paul even says he didn't meet a flesh and blood Jesus. It's in Galatians 1. He only had a revelation of Christ. And it was only inside him that he had this revelation. In Acts, this is depicted as a amorphous light and voice. And when we look at Acts 2, 
the only occasion that the gospel authors know of all the gospels that we have, the only instance in which there's an appearance to all the brethren is the uh, Pentecost ecstasy in Acts 2. And there, what do they see? They see tongues of fire above them, which so they're seeing amorphous lights. They feel the presence of Jesus and they interpret this as seeing Jesus, as, as being you know, blessed by his presence. And so that gets translated and, and conveyed by Paul in that same way. That there, and there's a mass trance. Everybody had sort of this experience of the inner Jesus, and they all claim to have had that experience at the same time. Now, we have lots of examples of these kinds of mass trances. Um, the Seventh-day Adventists experience this. Uh, we have the Shaker cults experience this. The ghost dance movement uh, had similar things like this. So we, we have lots of examples of this of people having these kinds of experiences. It doesn't really mean that there's an actual historical person. It means people have driven themselves up, frenzy, and frenzied themselves up into imagining that they're having this experience, that they feel the presence of Christ and therefore have seen Christ, that Christ has appeared to them. And maybe they associate with that with some visual phenomenon, like a light or some sort of uh, thing that they see in their visual field. Uh, but there's no indication in Paul that there's any specific uh, detail. It's not a body. They're not having dinner with Jesus. They're not uh, handling Jesus. And the same thing we get with when Paul talks about uh, the Eucharist. Paul conspicuously never mentions this as a Last Supper. He never calls it that. And he never says anything about Jesus coming again. When he, he finishes the speech of Jesus, Jesus says, until I come, as if he hadn't come yet. And he says, Paul says that he got this from the Lord, which means we know from other passages when Paul talks about this, he got it in a vision from the Lord. So the Lord told him this, he got this in a vision, and he's relating this. Uh, and you'll notice in Paul's version, there's no people present. There's no disciples. This isn't a supper in a room or anywhere. This is a ritual meal that Jesus is preaching to all future Christians. This is a vision, just like we get in Acts when Peter has a vision of a meal in the sky that teaches him something, and then he can go and convey this new lesson. Uh, that's exactly the kind of thing that Paul's talking about. So we, we have in here not only no evidence of Jesus, uh, but even indications that Paul has, still has no idea that this is stuff that happened on earth. This is stuff that you could only learn through Revelation and Scripture, exactly like he says in Romans 16. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> what else is there to go over? Um, yeah, the misleading rebuttal. Um, hanged Jesus and Talmud. That's a mis mistranslation. Um, in the Mishnah, this is standard Jewish law, uh, that after you are stoned, the body is always hung on a tree. This is Deuteronomy. This is standard Deuteronomy. This is Torah law, actually. But it's also in the Mishnah specific description of how you hang the body after execution, and then you take it down and bury it before sunset. Uh, this is a standard stoning execution. There's nothing weird about it. Uh, what is what is weird about it is that this isn't a Roman execution. This isn't Roman crucifixion. This isn't someone being nailed up uh, on a cross. This is someone who's stoned to death, and then their naked corpse is hung up uh, for shame, uh, and then buried in a criminal's graveyard. This is standard Jewish law. So the, Jewish, the Jews who wrote the Talmudic account have no knowledge of a Roman crucifixion. They only know about standard Jewish stoning and hanging and burial of Jesus. Uh, and they place it 100 years earlier, so they have no idea of the version that we hear about. So they clearly had no access to reliable information about this. And that's why we can't cite them as reliable. They have no reliable information, so we can't get any reliable information out of them. Uh, when we get to J the James passage in Josephus, so again, let's just assume that's what he wrote. I think there's really good evidence that he didn't. Uh, but you can find that in my writings. Uh, you can look at uh, why we can't trust anything on Josephus before 2014. That's on my blog site at richardcarrier.info. But put that aside. Let's assume that he actually wrote what we have. And this is what I assume in my study, actually, in my academic study. Paul says in Romans 8 that all baptized Christians are brothers of the Lord, uh, that Christ is the firstborn of many brethren, and that, in fact, we cry out, Abba, Father, at our baptism because we share in the death and resurrection of Jesus, and therefore we all become sons of God. And therefore, we all become co-heirs to the kingdom of God through uh, being co-heirs with the Son of God, the firstborn Son of God, which is Jesus. So Paul goes over this a lot of times that we are, if you are baptized Christians, you are uh, sons of God, and therefore you are all brothers of Jesus. So if James wrote this passage, he doesn't indicate whether he means biological brother or anything like that. Uh, all we know is that Josephus would have reported what Christians would have told him, because that would have been his only source, uh, or Jews just repeating what Christians said. Uh, back to Josephus. And if they said, well, okay, yeah, there was a brother of the Lord, the brother of Jesus was executed, he would just report that. We don't know that he knew uh, that that uh, was a fictive kinship designation that was common uh, within the Christian movement. We don't know that he meant that that was biological. Josephus doesn't say. So we actually can't use this as evidence of an actual biological Jesus because we have evidence that the brothers of the Lord was an actual common epithet 
uh, that the Christians use in, of, of each other. And that's why the Christians called each other brother is because they were all brothers of the Lord through baptism and thus adoption by a God. That's, that's throughout Paul, multiple passages. So that's not usable. So when you put the evidence back in that's being left out, you notice that the evidence is not strong anymore. Uh, and this is what my study does, is it takes all of these passages that are taken out of context and all of this evidence is left out to defend the historicity of Jesus. But when we bring that evidence back in, that historicity, that evidence evaporates. And this is a problem. And this is why we have to address the evidence. We can't rely on just what authorities say, what people say, et cetera. You got to look at the evidence. You got to look right back at it in particular. Um, uh, Gorilla Hebrew seems surprised that mythical people would have brothers. There's tons of mythical heroes that had named brothers and siblings and family. Uh, in fact, memorizing the genealogy and families of mythical heroes is one of the things that schoolboys did in ancient Greece uh, and, and, and even uh, ancient Palestine and so on. So if you, if you went to Greek school at all, uh, you, you did this. You, you studied the mythological names of mythological brothers of mythological heroes. This is uh, not abnormal at all. Uh, and there's also particular reasons why Mark invented Brothers for Jesus, but uh, we don't need to get into that today. If you're interested in that, I do talk about it. I have a whole section on it in my study on the historicity of Jesus. Um, I already went over the ministry of circumcision, the Eucharist. Um, Romans 1.3, Paul is just quoting Nathan's prophecy. This is a prophecy in the Old Testament that God would take sperm semen, literally it says semen, from David's belly and make a Messiah who would rule eternally on the throne, sit the throne eternally. Um, so whether Paul means this allegorically, just like he in Galatians 3 says that all Gentiles are the seed, the, ser the semen, the, the same word of Abraham, metaphorically. Obviously, he doesn't mean that literally. He means it metaphorically. Whether he means that for Jesus as well, in order to fulfill prophecy, or if he means some sort of metaphysical way that God made Jesus out of the flesh of David, made the, the flesh of Jesus that could die on the cross, etc. Um, we don't know. Paul doesn't say uh, but it had to be either one because uh, the prophecy said this had to happen. So whatever Paul thought was the actual place and way that Jesus died and was executed, whoever he really thought killed him and so on, uh, he had to think that God achieved this prophecy in some way. So for him to repeat it is exactly expected no matter what, whether Jesus existed or not. So that's why we can't trust this. And Galatians 4.4, 4, if you keep reading, you'll notice that Paul says that the women he's talking about are allegories. He's talking about being born to Hagar or born to Sarah as allegorical preaching regarding which world you are born to, the world of flesh or the world of the spirit. Uh, and so that's, again, we get the same thing here where when you look at the whole context, uh, yeah, thank you. When we get to the whole context, especially if you start in Galatians 3, when Paul's talking about allegorically the Gentiles being the seed of Abraham, that's the same speech in which he talks about Jesus being born of a woman. And then he gets down to us being born of a woman. And he says, the women I'm talking about are allegories, not actual literal women. So we can't use this either. So Paul is not talking about the biology of Jesus, so it's not usable uh, as evidence. Uh, but when you put the evidence back in that's being left out, it falls apart. Uh, First Timothy, again, all scholars agree is a second century forgery, so we can't use that. Um, <clears throat> and I think I've covered everything else, so uh, good to go. All right, Dr. Richard Carrier has yielded the last 20 seconds of his time. Make sure if you just coming into the room, just subscribe to the Brother Garfield podcast. Um, his Cash App is inside of the uh, um, the line below. You'll see it says Cash App Dollar Sign Ask Brother Garfield. Um, these funds help uh, give back um, to what was sent to the debaters, help with the platform to continue with um, debates of this magnitude. Um, there's a large following in the room right now, so please show as much support as you can. Um, the chat is free for you to communicate um, your position, your opinions, et cetera. Utilize it wisely. Um, please, no threats or anything like that in the chat, but you are free to speak of your opinion. Uh, we will, are now in the second round. Um, just got done with the 15-minute sections for both debaters. We'll be moving into the five-minute rebuttal um, for Guerrilla Hebrew in the second round. I will be calling the time at one minute to let you know it's one minute left. Uh, Gorilla Hebrew, would you be um, sharing your screen for this particular section? Uh, no, I don't believe I'll be sharing my screen for this section. All right. So the time is set at five minutes, and it will start when you start. All right. Again, I give all praise, honor, and glory to you. How about Shemiel Shah? So, um, 
first and foremost, uh, Dr. Richard Carrier mischaracterized my statement about him moving the goalpost. It was in no way in reference to the idea or the concept um, that scholars have of forgeries existing in the New Testament. That that was not what I was talking about with moving the goalpost at all. He also mischaracterized what I said about a standard that I allegedly purported in the beginning. I didn't lay out a standard in the beginning. I simply educated the audience as to what your peers have to say about you. Didn't make it the emphatic standard at any point. I'm just saying what your peers have to say about you. Um, you call me a cherry picker. Were well, you cherry picking as well? Um, do you notice I'd said what he was going to do? He's just nonchalantly dismissing every single thing and attempting to explain away every single thing <laughs> that he can. Okay, you can call First Timothy a forgery. What about all of the other evidences there? Oh, well, you know, that's a forgery and that's that and that. He just nonchalantly attempts to dismiss everything. This is the bulk of what he does in his argumentation. After you watch this debate, just type his name into YouTube. I watched several debates from him, and he's doing the exact same thing he did in all of those other debates. When he gets hit with something, he just tries to nonchalantly explain it away or dismiss it without any real evidence contrary to it, right? Moving on, he tries to downplay the fact that Christ had a ministry by saying, oh, that's the word deacon, and deacon means minister. Deacon is an established office in the Christian church that is a part of ministry. If he is using that word to describe Jesus, then that's letting you know that he had a ministry or a role in the church activity. Those are the offices that Paul appoints and assigns people to, right? Moving on. Um, it's funny. He said, oh, well, it, and it just means that he submitted himself. He was born under the law, meaning he submitted himself to the law. How do you cosmically submit yourself to a law that's enforced on the planet Earth by Jews? How can you submit yourself to something with no authority of the Sanhedrin or priests to enforce the law? How can you do that? That is literally your interpretation of Galatians 4 and 4 is literally one of the most ridiculous parts of all of your argumentation, right? And I'll delve into that further uh, momentarily. Um, so uh, again, so now when Paul says he appears to 500 people, guys, apparently they were doing LSD, you know, in ancient Israel. Now, I'm not going to act as if psychedelics were not used in religious service all over the world, but I would love to see any evidence that actually affirms that there was a use of psychedelic for mass sightings and things of that nature or how 500 people all had the same collective dream in ancient Judea or Palestine. I would love to see that, right? Um, also, um, he he tries to excuse the, the mention of the Last Supper. Well, Paul doesn't say it's the Last Supper. Nowhere in the Bible does it say it's the Last Supper. It's not called, it's called that later. Much later is it called the Last Supper by human beings, right? But we know what the Last Supper consisted of right now i'm gonna deal with this galatians 4 allegory ridiculousness so watch this right we're jumping all the way from verse 4 to verse 24 right he says which things are an allegory for these are two covenants the one from mount sinai which gender of bondage which is agar now let's skip up what things are an allegory all the way verse 4 or what he just said before this let's read for it is written that abraham had two sons one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman but he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory. Not verse four, that Christ was born of a woman, right? Made under the law. The verse 22 and 23, that's what he is identifying as an allegory. I'm going to keep reading. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. Well, an answer to Jerusalem, which is now and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free and the mother of us all. Right. So that's what is the allegory there talking about Sarah and Hagar. Notice here in verse four, it says, but when the fullness of time come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. Which woman? If it's the woman of the allegory, he's identifying who is the children of which woman there later on. Why doesn't he identify it there? Because that's not at all a part of the allegory. And of course, if we continue on right to Job 15 and 14, anybody can look up Job 15 and 14, where Job uses the phrase man born of a woman. 
To be born of a woman simply literally means to be a human being. It is a phrase in, in Jewry in the Hebrew language to describe an actual human being. So the fact that he said Jesus is born of a woman is acknowledging that he was in fact a human being. And of course, Jews were under the law. Uh, if he wasn't there, he wouldn't have been under the law. Uh, reset to five minutes. Make sure you guys, if you're just coming into the room, subscribe to the Brother Garfield podcast for high level debates of this magnitude. Dr. Richard Carrier versus Gorilla Hebrew. Did Jesus exist? We are in the second round towards the end at the five minute rebuttal of Dr. Richard Carrier. Uh, the time has reset. Dr. Richard Carrier, um, quick question. Would you like, are we sharing anything? Uh, no, nah, no, nah, I'll just speak. Thanks. No problem. So the time is set and it will start when you start. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let's, this is a perfect example right here of how Gorilla Hebrew leaves out evidence, cherry picks evidence, and then mischaracterizes the evidence. Uh, and when we put the evidence back in that he's leaving out, uh, and notice I'm not just claiming this, I'm actually presenting evidence. Of, so all the examples that he talked about before, where he says I presented no evidence Every single point I made, I presented evidence for. Uh, and if you go back and listen and watch, you'll notice I present evidence for everything that I say. Um, when Gorilla Hebrew does it, though, he leaves evidence out, and that's where we get where we are. So let's look at the actual argument of Paul in context, right? Let's never take verses out of context. Let's look at it in context. In Galatians 3, verse 26, and we'll read through Galatians 4, 4. We'll just, keep, just continuous text. This is Paul's argument. So and he's talking about Gentiles here. So he's talking, not Jews, he's talking about Gentiles. And he says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. So for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I am saying is that as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also when we are under age, we were under slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when he, uh, when the time set had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because we, uh, you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. And then immediately after that is when Paul talks about, what am I talking about? When I talk about slavery, what am I talking about? Which world order you're being submitted to? Uh, he starts with an allegory about how Gentiles can be the seed of Abraham. Allegorically, obviously, not literally, not biology. He's not talking about biology. And then he says at the end, he says, when I'm, I'm talking about these mothers here, I'm talking about allegorical mothers that represent states of being, that being uh, sub submitted to the flesh, being submitted to the spirit. Uh, and so that's his whole argument. It starts the verse right before uh, chapter four, and he keeps going all the way through. So yeah, it's allegory all the way through. Uh, so there, there's no doubt. He's not saying that allegory is only the one sentence that he says when he finally finishes his argument and explains what his whole argument has been about. When he explains what his whole argument has been about, that's what he's doing. He's explaining what his whole argument has been about from the seeds of Abraham allegory all the way to the mother's allegory. That's all part of his argument for how all of this can happen ontologically and cosmically. So he's not talking about uh, biolog biological stuff here at all. So this is not relevant. And then when we look at the Greek, very conspicuously, Paul did not use the Greek that would normally be used in the phrase born of a woman. Uh, usually it would be the word for actual birth. Uh, he, he eliminates that word. He replaces it with a word that means manufacture. And it's the same uh, word that uh, Paul uses to refer to the manufacturer of Adam, uh, who obviously wasn't born of a woman in any literal sense. And he uses it uh, of the resurrection bodies that God will make for us that also weren't, aren't born uh, to a woman. Uh, so he says those things are made. They're made by God. So when he changes the idiom, the standard idiom of born to a woman that normally refers to birth, uh, he changed it in a very peculiar way. And he did this also, by the way, in Romans 1.3, the exact same word swap, uh, where he's talking about manufacture and not birth. And so when we look at the actual evidence, this argument doesn't look very strong anymore. It looks like Paul's talking about allegorical things. He's not talking about literal biological birth, and he doesn't refer uh, to any kind of biological birth here in any clear way. So that evidence is too ambiguous to use. We don't know anything from Paul about what he thought about where Jesus was born or how. Um, <clears throat> so that's that. Um, what else can we cover here? Uh, I, I did find it amusing that when I talked about 
moving the goalposts that immediately in Gorilla Hebrews response. One minute left. Immediately in his response, he moved the goalposts on what, he, what I was even talking about, which that, that's hilarious. If you go back and watch that, that uh, my statement and his statement, it, it's pretty funny. Um, all of this stuff is checkable. This is the most important thing. So you don't have to trust him or him or me. Uh, so you can check all the claims we've debated here. And this, you know, this will be archived. You can watch it back and, and take notes and all of that stuff. And you can actually research this stuff and find out which of you, which of us is telling you all of the evidence, giving you all the evidence so that you can make a judgment from all of the evidence. And which of us is keeping evidence from you or trying to frame evidence out of the picture uh, that you can tell yourself. You don't have to, you don't have to believe me with that. Um, with regard to deacon, uh, that's not what it meant in antiquity. When Paul's using the word, it just means servant or administrator. Uh, so it, it doesn't mean preaching uh, at that time. It only meant someone who actually performed a function. And Paul's talking about the function that Jesus performed, where he assumed the body of flesh and therefore took on the sins of the world to die, uh, to kill them on uh, in his own body. And Paul is explaining uh, in Galatians 4 how he does that. Uh, so if you want to know why, how Paul talks about Jesus doing this, Galatians 4 is all about this. 3 to 4. Galatians 3 to 4 is all about that. All right. <clears throat> make sure you subscribe to the Brother Garfield's uh, podcast on YouTube. That's where we're streaming right now. Make sure you subscribe if you just come into the room. Uh, the debate is, did Jesus exist? Dr. Richard Carrier versus Gorilla Hebrew. Um, we are now about to enter into the third round. Uh, the post-debate build um, will be on Clubhouse. If you have not uh, downloaded Clubhouse, download the Clubhouse app and follow the Guy First Game platform. We'll be throwing a post-debate build in there. You can come in and share um, how you feel about what took place in reference to the debate. Um, but right now, we will be going into a short commercial. Uh, Brother Garfield, are you here? Yes, yes, my brother. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, so ladies and gentlemen, um, this is one of the sponsors for tonight, Abju Wear. I want you to check out the um, the clothing, the sneakers. It has a bunch of catalogs. It's Abju Wear, A B D J U W E A R dot com. He's in Atlanta, Georgia. You see all the stuff. You got the shirts, you got the sneakers, you got the slippers, you got all the ladies' footwear and all that stuff in different colors and all that stuff right here, sneakers. So shout out to Abju Wear as one of the sponsors. And I want to give a shout out to my sister, um, Monica Lamb. She works with veterans on Wednesdays. So you could check her show out on Wednesdays, Urban Economic Empowerment Show. But she deals with the veterans. And this is an event coming up September the 11th. Um, if you have VA work, you got to turn in. If you have prosthetic issues, mental health awareness, veteran supporting services, it's September the 11th. This is in South Carolina. And we also have another event. This is in um, the Department of South Carolina for the veterans. There's a golf tournament day, September 23rd, and we need like 30 volunteers for that. And of course, we have something also on Saturday, November the 11th, which is Veterans Day. There's a walk, roll, run, and tide. It starts at Lake Murray Dam at 9 a.m. virtual or in person, and you see the prices. If you need to um more information, you could always email me at axbrothergarfield at gmail.com. This is for the people in South Carolina, all right? All right, thank you, my brother. All right, peace. Definitely, definitely. Make sure y'all uh, uh, subscribe to the Brother Garfield podcast. Um, also, inside of the, uh, you'll see right there, right above the chat, it says Cash App, dollar sign, ask Brother Garfield. That goes to the support of the debaters as well as the support of the platform uh, for putting together high level uh, debates like we have tonight. Did Jesus exist? Dr. Richard Carrier, PhD scholar, verse chief priest, Alazar Bon Lawyer aka gorilla hebrew we will we'll now be moving into the third round uh it'll be 15 minutes on gorilla hebrew then uh 15 minutes on dr richard carrier and then they will move into the rebuttals for the third round five minutes for gorilla hebrew and then five minutes for dr richard carrier it is definitely getting testy now and the uh, uh, tensions is uh high but the time will be set at 15 minutes and uh, would you be sharing the screen at all, Gorilla Hebrew? Yeah, yeah, I'm sharing the screen. All right, so let me go ahead and get you set so that doesn't hurt your time. Um, and you should be good to go. I have your um, your screen up. And the time will start when you start. Yeah, of course. First and foremost, again, I have to give all praises, honor, and glory to Yahweh, <laughs> Bashim, Yahweh, Shah. So uh, it, it's hilarious. Uh, Dr. Richard Carrier, he's saying that I'm leaving things out. 
That's what he, he said it now two times. But he began his premise making bold declarative statements that I brought scriptures that at least seem contradict. He didn't mention any of the scriptures that I brought out at all. So how is he then not leaving things out and cherry picking? I need somebody to make that make sense. See, this is a debate. It's called, did Jesus exist, right? I'm the affirmative. He's the negative. So what is he going to do? Present the negative evidence. What am I going to do? Present the positive evidence. That's how this thing works. That's not called cherry picking and leaving things out. That's called how a debate works. It's your job to present the negative, and it's my job to present the positive. For you to attempt to characterize that as something sinister is very dishonest and, frankly, crazy, right? Moving on. <laughs> Right now, I'm going to pick up back where I left off. See, he talks about allegories in Galatians 3 and Galatians 4, but he specifies and he qualifies the allegories in both of those instances. Right. And then he mentions Adam and he says Adam doesn't have parents. But we know if we read Genesis that when Adam's son Cain runs off, he goes to a city where there's a place people and he gets wives. So that must mean that Adam is not literally the first human being, according to the understanding of the ancient Jews. Right now, somebody might say, well, some do understand or this is that or this is that. And there's also contrary there. But if we just read Genesis in and of itself, there's no way we can conclude that Adam is literally the first person without father and mother. There's no way to conclude that. Right. But that's neither here nor there. Let me get back to Galatians 4. Again, let's read Galatians 4 and 5, or 4 and 4 to 5 again, right? But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. He used that Adam for the manufacturing, right? But of course, again, Adam in, has inferred parents because his son goes and meets people. Right. So again, but when the fullness of this time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. So again, this is Job 15 and 14. What is man that he should be clean and he which is born of a woman that he should be righteous. So what what is somebody who is born of a woman? A man who exists where? On earth. Right. Let's go now to uh, 1 Corinthians now 9 and 20. And to the Jew and unto the Jews, and I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. So who is he identifying as under the law? The Jews. And to be under the law, there has to be an authority over you, subjugating you to the law. So if Jesus Christ is cosmic and not here on earth, subjugated to the authorities of the Torah, this can't be true, right, and or exact. So that is another, again, kill shot to your entire ideology. Let's now point ourselves and our attention to the presentation. So it's funny. He says, so a brother of Jesus simply means a baptized follower of Jesus, according to him. Right. Essentially, he's calling it a layman ranking, if you will, in the church opposed to the chief ranking of the apostles. Right. This is what he said also in other debates I've seen him have. Right. So now look at this. This is first Corinthians nine and five. Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles and as of the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? This is a very telling verse that exposes Richard Carrier's entire argumentation. Let's analyze the way these people are listed in that verse. First, there is a qualification of apostles, then the brothers of the Lord. Then lastly, we see Cephas, who we know is an apostle, which is Peter. This lets us know that everyone on that list is considered an apostle, right? Because you're not going to start a list, have qualified as apostle, only be talking about the apostles as the first and last person, but not the middle person. So this lets us know that everyone on that list is considered an apostle. But according to Dr. Carrier, a brother of the Lord is a rank in the church underneath the apostles and no actual bearing on biological relationship with Jesus. We've now determined that's wrong. Paul is clearly acknowledging there is in 1 Corinthians 9 and 5 that Jesus is it, Jesus, in fact, has biological brethren, as we also see affirmed in the gospel of Mark, further proving Jesus was an actual person in history. He existed. Let's go back to Mark. In fact, just briefly. I have Mark 3 at. Mark uh, 6 and 3. 
Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah, right? James and Jude, the apostles, the people who are at least purported to be the authors of the uh, book of James and the book of Jude and Simon and are not his sisters here with us. And um, and they were offended uh, at him. So clearly we see here the his brothers, his biological brothers listed. And we see Paul affirming that right now. He says, oh, well, a mythological creature, uh, a, a mythological being can't have brothers. But that's not the point when the person you're saying does not believe that this person is real, is saying that biological people that he is interacting with are his brothers. <laughs> right. That's not what that is at all. Right. Right. Uh, oh, OK, so let's do a quick recap on much of what I presented here tonight. The mainstream scholarly consensus holds that there was a historical Jesus who lived in the first century CE, Roman Judea, and that he was probably both baptized and crucified. Mysticism or uh, mysticism is rejected as a French theory by virtually all scholars of antiquity. A number of critics have rejected Carrier's ideas and methodology, calling it tenuous or very weak or slight or problematic and unpersuasive. Tacitus attests to historical Jesus. Josephus attests to historical Jesus. The Talmud attests to a historical Jesus. And I want to make something clear, right? Because he consistently wants to bring the argument, well, they, they didn't have the time right in for the umpteenth time, the fact that the Jews were the number one antagonist, at least initially, of following Jesus Christ, that they still refer to him, act as if, treat him as if he was an actual historical figure when they could have dismissed the entire ideology by hammering in the point, right? And not just some friends argumentations. And again, rabbinical tradition is serious. It's very well maintained, right? There is a, a very clear demonstrable lineage in rabbinical tradition, right? In none of these times is the rabbinical tradition saying this guy never existed. It would be that easy to have shut down the widespread of Christianity, which took away from jewelry. Guys, he wasn't real. We're around. You're saying this is real. This is not real. They're saying this is a guy that it was cosmic. It was in outer space. This doesn't happen, right? So even if they got details wrong, again, we have to remember, right? And I think it's so hilarious and convenient when people act as if 2,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago, 200 years ago, 100 years ago, there was Google, that we had a smartphone to go, wait, was there a guy named Jesus? Or why didn't we hear about that? Facts were not kept like that. They were not reported like that. There wasn't even, in general, especially there in um. A Judea, a newspaper or anything the like that exists. We know about the gazettes elsewhere, but in Judea, there was not a such thing, right? They didn't have the smartphone there, right? So understanding that they could have got details wrong, right? They still are attesting to his existence and they're attesting to his execution for whatever reason. It's still being attested to and all they would have to do to get rid of him is just denounce he ever exists, affirm he never existed, go into what you're going into and show it, but instead they never do that. They always engage him as a historical figure. They discredit him. They say all kind of madness about him, but they don't say he didn't exist. That's important, right? So again, the Talmud attests to a historical Jesus Paul attests to Jesus' nuclear biological family, a ministry, the Last Supper, a conversation with Pilate, death, burial, being seen by 500 people at once. But Dr. Rich here says Paul never places him in human history or even believes him to have been a man that walked the earth. Additionally, again, we have Pythagoras. No authentic writings of Pythagoras have survived. Almost nothing is known for certain about his life. The earliest sources on Pythagoras' life are brief, ambiguous, and often satirical. Three ancient biographies of Pythagoras have survived from late antiquity, all of which are filled primarily with myths and legends. Alexander the Great died in 323 B.C., 
Of the five main surviving accounts of Alexander, not one of them was written until 150 to 200 years after his death. Several myths exist about Alexander the Great, including his deification. They made him into a god. Alexander and a prophetess claimed that Alexander's true father was Zeus Amun. Plutarch said the goddess Artemis delivered him at his birth. But nobody's saying Alexander the Great is it real. Right. We see similar mythologization. We see much later historical sources than his actual life. Right. Yet we're not saying Alexander the Great didn't exist. We're not keeping that same energy for him. Right. Yet none of the aforementioned facts about either of these historical figures compels Dr. Richard Carrier or anyone else in academia. Right. For that matter, to deny their existence. Now, I do have to come with a correction. He he did present the fact that there are people who are now doubting Pythagoras' existence. Okay, cool. And that's fine, right? But I know that when I was in school, they taught me what? The Pythagorean theorem. They taught me. They didn't teach me nothing about Jesus in school, but they definitely taught me about the Pythagorean theorem. So we know that this is an individual that for much of time has been spoken about as if he emphatically was a historical figure that exists, right? There has not been nearly the type of kickback on his existence that there has been on Jesus, right? Yet it's still, there is more compelling evidence for Jesus' existence, which leads me to rest. With that, I give all praise, honor, and glory to you. How about Shemiel Shai? Yield the rest of my time. All right, good deal. Let me uh, stop you from sharing. Let me see. From stream. All right, let me stop the time. Uh, with three, a little over three minutes. Uh, Gorilla Hebrew yields the rest of his time. Make sure you guys are showing your financial support to the cash app dollar sign ask brother Garfield. Dollar sign ask brother Garfield. Um, these funds really help support the platform as well as the debaters, especially of this magnitude, uh, to be able to bring them on and uh share this um, information and edification that they have um if you guys can't well what i'll do is reset the 15 minutes uh, i want to remind you that the post debate bill room will be on clubhouse on a clubhouse app if you don't have the clubhouse app please download that um it'll be in a god first gang room we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second and uh share the links for it uh let's see nothing happened all right good deal yeah, I mean, we got ours posted at the top. All right, good deal. So we got the 15 minutes set for Dr. Richard Carrier. Dr. Richard Carrier, would you be sharing your screen uh, for this 15 minutes? Uh, yeah, I'm going to make a, a few quick points and then I'll pull up a screen. Is that all right? Oh, yeah, no problem. I'll just, uh, I'll wait right when you uh, pull it up. I'll be okay, good. good. Try to be on time with it. So the time will start when you start, Dr. Richard Carrier. All right, so don't get a lot of time, so I'm going to be really quick. Uh, I actually rebutted most of these points earlier already. I already presented the evidence, uh, so you can go back over that. Um, but the new stuff that was brought up, the Alexander the Great stuff, um, everything Gorilla Hebrew said about that is false. Uh, we have tons of eyewitness and contemporary attestations of Alexander the Great, like a lot. Uh, uh, so if we had that for Jesus, we, we wouldn't be having this argument. The fact that we don't have that for Jesus is why there's there's room to doubt and why we should actually start looking at the evidence more closely. Uh, so Alexander the Great is a terrible example. Um, we have tons of evidence for him. Uh, mass ecstasies, uh, Gorilla Hebrew asked for evidence of that. Uh, we could do a whole discussion on it. Um, I cite abundant scholarship, abundant evidence and examples in element 15 in chapter four of my book on the historicity of Jesus. Uh, this is standard in the field. Uh, there's tons of evidence for dream visitations of gods, uh, waking visions of gods, mass ecstasies, and things like that. I, I talk about all of that there. Uh, this is established science. There's nothing weird about that. And it doesn't require LSD, by the way. It doesn't require any kind of hallucinogens. Uh, humans are actually naturally prone to enter into altered states of consciousness through trance behaviors, sleep deprivation, and things like that. Um, Paul actually says Adam is the first man in 1 Corinthians 15, so... Uh, that argument is out. Uh, obviously, Paul thought Paul Adam was the first uh, thing. And he even says that in the same place where he's talking about God will make our future bodies for us in the same way that he made Adam's. Um, Paul says that we are not born to Hagar. Uh, uh, and what he's saying there is that Paul cannot mean that Jesus was born to Hagar either. So that, that's, that's not what Paul is saying. He's not talking about that at all. 
Uh, it's an allegory about what world order you come into, whether the world of flesh or the world of spirit. Becoming incarnate puts you into the world of, makes you a son of Hagar uh, in an allegorical sense. And that's what, that's what Paul is talking about. Um, made under the law, uh, Paul's talking about the law of death. Uh, so when, when you become mortal, you're subject to death. The only escape from that, uh, to live forever, to be resurrected, is either Torah or Christ. And that's Paul's point. Christ is better. Uh, he goes on making that point. In 1 Corinthians 9.5, Paul is actually arguing that if ordinary rank and file Christians, uh, in other words, he's saying if uh, people who are just brothers of the Lord and not apostles, if even they get the right to financial and, and meal support on travels, on church business, then Paul himself, an actual apostle, should do so as well. So when you look at the argument there, it doesn't really fit the context of he's talking. He's not talking about apostles. He deliberately is talking about rank and file Christians. If even they get this right, then he as an apostle should get this right. Then you can look in there and see how that operates. And the relevance of the Talmud is this. The Jews of the Talmud had no way of knowing Jesus didn't exist so as to challenge it. That's my point. They have no reliable access to information. They have no access. So they can't make that argument. That's why they don't make that argument. They make the argument that they can make with the information that they have, which is demonstrably poor. Uh, and that's uh, what I pointed out with examples earlier. Uh, when we look at earlier centuries, earlier than Talmud, we find evidence that Jews are actually willing to doubt the historicity of Jesus, even though they, they couldn't disprove it either because they couldn't, didn't have access to any of the evidence because we're talking about still a century after the fact, 100 years later, they, they couldn't tell, but they still doubted. And we even saw evidence that Christians, there were Christians who doubted the historicity of Jesus as well. Um, so quickly, I'm gonna go into, uh, let me just bring up one slide. Uh, you know what, you know, I'm going to bring up that, uh, I'm going to bounce around a bit. So let's see, let me pull some things in and let me pull my slides up. And I hope I'm clicking the right one. Yeah. Okay. So uh, is it on screen? Is it showing? I hope it is. Could someone confirm? One second. See. Pulling it up right now. Is it showing? Yes. Want, okay, good. I just wanted to make sure the slide was up so I didn't go talking. Um, okay, so uh, we can begin. Um, look at this timeline. This timeline shows it's very unusual. There's no other historical figure do we have this timeline of evidence where the cult begins or the, the figure is supposed to have lived. And then decades later, we just hear about him as a revelatory being. We hear no mention of him uh, walking around before he died and appeared to people in visions. And then a lifetime later, then we get these wildly mythological tales, uh, just like any other mythology of other heroes who were invented uh, and put into history in the same way. And then it's only decades, another lifetime after that, that we start seeing evidence uh, outside the Gospels, and that's they're just using the Gospels. So the trajectory of evidence suggests that we have uh, not a historical person here. This is unusual. Remember, uh, pre-existent pre celestial being revealed Gospel. Gospels lifetime later, wildly fictional. Um, all later attestations based on them. Not even the Gospels are independent of each other. The, all the other evidence is lost, and yet we have tons of evidence being forged. So we know this is a group that likes to make stuff up. Uh, and so we can't really, we, it's very hard to trust this evidence in a way we don't have uh, for other things. Let's look at Socrates. Um, we know the names of numerous eyewitnesses. Uh, we know not even one uh, who wrote books about him. We know not even one such book for Jesus. We know the titles of some of these books and have a number of paraphrases and quotations from them. Uh, two of them we actually have, Xenophon and Plato. Uh, and they were written within a few years of his death, not nearly a half a century later. And in his own country and language, uh, the gospels written in foreign language, foreign land and language. Uh, let's keep going. We have an eyewitness third party account written during his lifetime, Aristophanes, the clouds. Uh, we know of not even one such account for Jesus. We have many contemporaries attesting to Socrates, filling four modern volumes. Uh, we have none for Jesus other than as a celestial being. We have quotations from many historians of Socrates using written sources about Socrates from his own time, like Idomeneus. Uh, we have none of that for Jesus, only repeaters of the Gospels. And yet there was no global church of Socrates to preserve records of him. And yet we have way more records of him than we have for Jesus. So that, that's really suspicious. Uh, and I'll back out of there. And this is really my point. And when you start looking at the evidence and you start making the comparisons correctly, uh, these comparisons don't hold up. Um, if we had for Jesus what we have for Socrates, yeah, I would be convinced that he existed, but we don't have that. The, the evidence is exactly the opposite of that. Uh, and that's why it leads to doubt. Uh, and I'm not absolutely certain that there wasn't a Jesus. I come to top odds of one in three chance there was. Uh, so I'm not adamantly against the possibility. And I think they're entirely plausible 
reconstructions of a historical Jesus. I've even discussed some of them myself. Uh, if you want to find an amusing example of me talking about what I think is the most likely historical Jesus uh, of the various possibilities, um, my talk, uh, You're All Gonna Die, uh, the Wichita uh, uh, end of days talk. Uh, you can you can Google you're all going to die, Richard Carrier, and then <laughs> you'll see you'll see my uh, talk there, right? Where I go into this about how there's a plausible historical Jesus. He's not supernatural Jesus. Uh, he's he's a failed failed apocalyptic prophet, like all mainstream scholars generally agree. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's entirely plausible. Uh, I just think when we look at the evidence, the balance of evidence does not trend in favor of it. I think it looks like he started as an imaginary being seen in revelations and ecstasies and then was put into history later, just like all the other savior gods. Remember, I mentioned uh, many other savior gods like that that were also didn't exist, but were also put in history with similar books and stories uh, like the Gospels about them. Uh, and so um, that's my point. I think uh, anything else has already been, uh, already been said. So uh, I'll just close with that. All right, good deal. Um, Dr. Richard Carrier yields with uh, over seven minutes on the clock. I'll reset at the five minute rebuttal for Gorilla Hebrew. Uh, make sure you are following the platform and subscribe to the Brother Garfield podcast if you're just entering into the room. Subscribe to the platform as well as show your financial support to the cash app dollar sign ask Brother Garfield. Dollar sign ask Brother Garfield. This is to help the platform grow as too well to make sure that um, debaters um, don't leave empty handed. Um, so please show your financial support to the cash app dollar sign ask brother Garfield. We are in the, uh, still in the third round going into the rebuttal section of the third round. Uh, five minutes on Gorilla Hebrew. Gorilla Hebrew would you be sharing a screen? Uh, yeah I'll be sharing a screen. Alright so let's go ahead and get that up. Uh, let's see. I have a screen. All right, and the time will start when you start. We're going to visit the Socrates thing in a second, but of course, first and foremost, I got to give all praises, honor and glory to Yahweh Bashem, Yahweh Shai. Um, what's interesting is he consistently is just saying that Jesus and Christianity is just another what he classifies as a savior cult, right? A cult that's based around a mythological savior. I can't recall of any of these savior cults or mythological saviors who were crucified by an actual verified historical person, right? And I think that is an emphatic difference between Jesus and all of these cults in which um, you're trying to compare him to. And we'll get further into that in the Q&A. Um, also, just to go into the word for minister there, because again, he is continually trying to downplay this minister thing. If we go to Romans 15 to 25, right? Paul says, but now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints, right? So Paul was going to do his ministry unto the saints. And that word is actually the same word that's used to call Christ the minister of the circumcision. So we know that this is an actual uh, ministry that is on the earth right now. Going on, he said that, oh, well, we know that Paul couldn't have meant it like uh, Adam uh, uh, as the first person, basically. He says that Paul understood that Adam was the first man because of a particular verse. Let's read what Paul said about the first man, Adam. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last man, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. He's referring to Christ there as the last man, Adam. Is Christ the last man to ever live? Because according to you, he never lived. So if... He means the first man, Adam, is his actual understanding that literally Adam is the first person ever. Then Jesus Christ would be the last person ever, according to your logic, meaning no one would ever be born after him. But also meaning that your entire ideology is not true because this is a man. <laughs> right. You see how problematic that is. So, no, Paul and the Jews did not believe, at least in antiquity, that Adam was the first person person so your reference to the word manufacture being used in reference to jesus trying to disqualify the fact that he has parents that was born on earth is again even further out the window right moving on right um also another straw man was made i didn't question whether or not mass ecstasy happens right i understand that it happens all over the place right i asked specifically for you to demonstrate it happening in judea in this time period that's what i asked you for Right. Um, now, 
Right. Oh, he said nothing I said about Alexander is true. So the several myths about Alexander aren't true. Alexander going around saying his father was Zeus is not true. Or or people saying that Artemis delivered uh, Alexander when he was. That's not true. Is that what you're saying? Right. I would call that. I would call that. Um, not, I would call what you said untrue in regards to that. Um, also, I, this is the thing for Socrates, right? So let's get here. Contradictory accounts of Socrates make a reconstruction of his philosophy nearly impossible, a situation known as the Socratic problem. So I have something written here, right? Socrates was written about by his followers, right? Same thing that we have for Jesus, right? And then we have contradictory quotes that make it hard to actually reconstruct for scholars. It's called, it's literally in, in scholarship called the Socratic problem. Some of his followers wrote about him. Yes, the same way Jesus' followers wrote about him, right? And some of Socrates' followers, a lot of what they wrote about him contradicts. So it's hard to even prove that any of it actually was true because so many, so much of it is contradictory, right? So what I'm saying is it's essentially the equivalent to what we have, or it's at least very similar to what we have for Jesus. A lot of the initial sources are things that we have simply from his followers, right? Meaning. These are people that have what we call skin in the game, right? Versus like a Tacitus, for example, that has no skin in the game, yet attest to Jesus. And I know he tried to dismiss it. But the fact is when Tacitus has hearsay or something that he does not regard as substantiated historical fact, he notates it as I demonstrated in my previous slide in regards to that. Y'all can go back. So I believe that was round two, right? So again, as he's demonstrated serially over and over in this debate, when he don't like something, when it goes against what he's saying, he simply just tries to nonchalantly dismiss it, right, and mischaracterize. These are all the things in which his colleagues said he was going to do. These are all the things I've been watching him do all over YouTube to other people. And, of course, to no surprise, he did it again. With that, we give all praise, honor, and glory to you. Good deal. Let me make sure we move the stream. Uh, Gorilla Hebrew yields the remaining of his time. Uh, let me reset at five minutes. Dr. Richard Carrier, it will be on you shortly. Make sure you guys are following and subscribing to the Brother uh, Garfield podcast, putting together these major debates for us. Um, and make sure you send your funds in to support and show your support uh, financially um, to the Cash App. Ask or dollar sign, ask Brother Garfield. We are about to conclude the third round with the five-minute rebuttal of Dr. Richard Carrier. Uh, Dr. Richard Carrier, are you ready? And would you like to share a screen for this part? No, I'll just speak. <clears throat> Thank you. Right, deal. So the floor is yours, and the time will start when you start. Yeah, uh, we're just getting the same stuff and I've already refuted over and over again. Uh, we have no verified accounts of the crucifixion of Christ. Um, the Talmud even says that he was stoned and hung uh, in accordance with Deuteronomy law. So uh, we have no reliable accounts of this. Uh, we have completely wildly contradictory accounts of it that are all uh, based on myth. Uh, if you look at the, even the Talmudic account is some sort of myth uh, that arose later. It's not an actual historical account of the crucifixion of Jesus. Uh, so we, ha we have nothing like that. Uh, Paul doesn't talk about the specifics of where or how or by whom uh, Christ was crucified. And, and so that's the situation that we're in. We don't have that uh, actual uh, added material. Uh, now, Grill Hebrew asks for other examples. I mean, there's tons. I, I put up a name, a, bunch, a whole list of names of gods earlier uh, in one of my slides. Um, there are many myths of dying gods who bring salvation. Uh, Osiris, for example, was murdered by his brother, uh, and then was resurrected by his sister. And then those baptized into the name of Osiris are reborn. Literally, uh, reborn is the word used in the, the cult at the time. They're reborn to eternal life uh, and through baptism. So, and the baptism was going through his death and resurrection. Uh, it's described this way in Apuleius. Uh, he writes a reverent uh, religious text about it called the Golden Ass, um, where he discusses, uh, he has a whole chapter where it's about the ritual of baptism and, and this, the theology behind it in Osiris cult. Uh, so the, this is exactly what the Christians are talking about. They just made a Jewish version of it. So they're using Jewish ideas to frame the entire thing. And so, but Osiris, he's put in history too, but we know for a fact he didn't exist. We can, we can look at all the records of ancient Egypt. There's no Osiris. Uh, he and originally was just a celestial deity. 
and only much later was he imported into history as a purported historical pharaoh, but there was no such pharaoh. Uh, that's Osiris. We have Inanna, uh, who is a Sumerian goddess. Um, she's almost literally crucified. She's struck dead by a death spell, and her naked body is nailed up. Uh, the corpse is nailed up uh, in shame. Uh, and then she rises from the dead three days later uh, and ascends to glory. Uh, and there's, uh, even though we, we can't tie that specific story to Salvation Cult in, in the Roman period, there were Roman cults uh, tied to that. We just don't know uh, exactly how they taught uh, their salvation, but they did offer uh, the same kind of thing. Initiation into the mysteries uh, got you some sort of eternal life. Uh, the initiate, in that case, Inanna and Tammuz, which was one of the Adonis cults of the time. Uh, so we have lots of examples of this. Bacchus cult is another one. Zalmoxus cult is another one. Uh, there, this kind of thing happened a lot. And these are all mythical deities that were put into history. Uh, and they're all savior deities. They all give you eternal life uh, in, in the same way, in a similar way. Um, now, again, this thing with the last Adam, Paul does not say Jesus was the last man. He very conspicuously leaves the word man off. Uh, when he says Adam is the first man, he does say man. He says Adam, the first man, Adam. Uh, but when he says Jesus is the last Adam, he doesn't say Jesus is the last man. He just says Jesus is the last Adam, meaning that Jesus completes and undoes the sin of Adam that caused all the problems that Jesus came to solve. Right. So like Jesus is the bookend of the story that begins with Adam um, being that now that Jesus has died to sin and resurrected and we can now be saved for, from death through through Jesus. That's Paul's whole the whole thing in First Corinthians 15 is about exactly that. That's the whole point of it. Uh, so he, he doesn't say he doesn't say that he doesn't say that uh, Jesus is the last man, uh, but he does say that Adam's the first man. Uh, so that's important. Um, and quite frankly, uh, there isn't anything else to rebut. Uh, that's kind of it. I, I mean, I've rebutted everything else. Uh, there just aren't any arguments here. I think, uh, what's my time left? So let me, what do I have, Corey? One minute and 14 seconds. All right. So I'll just, uh, just in general point is that when you look at this evidence, you, you can't take evidence out of context. You can't frame it away so that you don't see all the surrounding evidence that calls it into question that, Makes it appear in a different light. Uh, if you want to look at the evidence, you've got to really look at the evidence in context, in its historical context, in its literary context, and so on. Uh, and then you can see uh, that the evidence is actually much more ambiguous. And that's weird. Uh, we don't have this ambiguities in any of the texts about Socrates. Like the evidence for Socrates is clear, it's abundant, uh, it's contemporary, uh, we have lots of it. Um, we just don't have that for Jesus. What we have is when, when we have stuff for Socrates, people meeting him and talking about him and stuff from their own time, we have people talking about only seeing Jesus in visions uh, and never mentioning anyone. See, you look at 1 Corinthians 15, never mentions anyone ever meeting Jesus or seeing Jesus before he died. It's only in visions after he died of the risen Jesus that people see him. Uh, and things like that, Romans uh, 25, 26, or Romans 16, 25 to 27. Uh, if you look at Romans 10, verses 14 to 16, uh, again and again, Paul's talking about, and even Galatians 1, you're talking, he talks about you meet Jesus in a revelation, not in flesh and blood. And he talked about this over and over again. So that's the evidence. And then we get the myths a lifetime later. That's not what we get for Socrates. Socrates, we get mundane history right out of the gate, uh, tons of it, and that's it. So that's why it's different. Make sure you are subscribed to the Brother Garfield podcast. We are now moving into the questionnaire round. One second. Uh, boom. Yeah, let me just give a quick, I'm sorry, Corey. Let me do a quick Go ahead, brother. Okay, okay, you got it. To Dr. Kip Davis in the building. We were just talking about him earlier. And uh, he might be a potential person that might want to debate through this platform too. So shout out to Dr. Kip Davis for checking it out. And also for Myth Vision, who's in the building. Subscribe to Myth Vision Podcast, one of the best channels on YouTube with all the scholars. All right? Thanks. No problem. Uh, shout out to the Brother Garfield. Uh, podcast. Make sure you subscribe to it if you're just entering into the room. Show your financial uh, support to the Cash App dollar sign Ask Brother Garfield. Uh, we just concluded the opening presentation, round one, round two, and round three. We now move into the questionnaire round. Questions and answers. Uh, Gorilla Hebrew will be asking Dr. Richard Carrier questions first. Um, this is only a seven minute period that will uh, consist of five questions. Uh, the answering section of the seven minute period is not time. But if I feel like you're being too long winded, uh, we want to make sure those five questions do get asked. And I'll try to get.
get you to land your plane as soon as you can so that we can move on to the next question. Uh, do both debaters agree and understand? Yes, sir. All right, good deal. So we'll move into the seven minute period. We have it at the top uh, right now. So, uh, Gorilla Hebrew, are you ready? Would you be sharing your screen or presenting anything? No, no. All right, good deal. So the time set is at seven minutes. Questionnaire round, Gorilla Hebrew is on you. So, uh, just to be clear, right do you believe that jesus existed uh i think there's a one in three chance that he did uh, which means preponderance of evidence he probably didn't but i'm not sure of that so it's not not emphatic that he didn't exist no, no, no okay. absolutely not okay perfect so um my next question is you mentioned various savior gods so just to be clear i want to ask you a very concise question which of the savior gods right that you referenced can you demonstrate with a primary source that was crucified uh, or killed by a verified historical figure well jesus isn't any more verified than any of them so the same we have the same evidence for jesus as we have for that, bacchus that, or anana that, it's the same evidence question. Dr. Richard Carrier. But there I'm, is I'm, no verified evidence, is what I'm saying. No, there's no, 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 there's no verified no, no, case. No, no. I, again, I, I didn't add, that's not I would the say, question. So if you want a literal answer to your question, the number is zero, including Jesus. Jesus is not even answered. But, but so, 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 so you, you don't have to stoop to that, sir. It, it was a very simple question. It means, for the record, you're saying zero of the gods that you attempted to liken mm -hmm. Jesus unto including are. Jesus. are yeah. No, oh, no, no. I, I didn't. You can't include you, you Jesus. You can't dodge that. No. The, 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 the question, evidence is the same. It's the same quality. The, oh, but, but, see, no, notice this. I asked you a very specific question. Yeah, I and you and, and, and you very rudimentary. rudimentary you're you're took, trying took, to manipulate. Took, you're sir, trying sir, to manipulate. I, I'm, not try, I'm not trying rather to manipulate. Rather than just hear what I'm saying. I'm not saying. trying to manipulate anything. Yeah, you're yeah. the one that's trying to manipulate. You, you know, didn't you, want to answer the question. You're trying to manipulate. You're trying to manipulate my answer by. Doctor, doctor, no, you're trying to manipulate your answer. You're Dude, trying to manipulate your answer. That's clear. No, I'm being clear. I'm the one being clear. You're the one trying to talk over me while I'm being clear. I'm the one that asked you a question and couldn't get a straight answer. So I one gave second. you the correct answer. One second. I don't want to meet you. I don't want to meet you guys. I want to meet you guys. Uh, I like the energy. Uh, I stopped the time at five minutes and 31 seconds. I want to make sure the questions come out clear and the answers is clear. And uh, Dr. Richard Carey is not framing a question and Gorilla Hebrew is not framing the answer. I'm um, not uh, saying you got any of that, but I want to make sure it's clear. So, Gorilla Hebrew, can you go back to your last question? And can uh, Richard Carrier, if you can give an answer to the question, and I will not start the time until both of those things are complete. Cool. Beautiful. So, very concisely, my question is, which of the Savior gods that you likened unto Jesus was killed was killed by an actual verified person in history. No one. Thank you. All right, the time will start. Uh, next question. Um, because this is very peculiar to me in regards to a position that you're taking on the same line as the Savior guys, right? And that's what we what i what i at least gather from the 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 apostles right and you can correct me if i'm wrong if you have any historical evidence outside of what i'm going to say but what i gather from the apostles what's a consistent theme in the new testament right is that the apostles were unlearned right so i would like to understand how these unlearned galileans number one were versed enough in their own tradition to be able to then go to egypt and get learned enough in egyptian tradition or any other uh, surrounding place tradition where a savior God can be adapted and then repackage their own version of a savior God. How is that possible for these peasant Galileans? Well, uh, we have no evidence that they're peasant Galileans. Uh, first of all, uh, that's part of the mythology. And I also think the, their supposed illiteracy, which is only mentioned in acts, uh, is only established in acts. And I think that's another myth. It's like the myth of Muhammad's illiteracy, right? Uh, here's a reason why we know that they can't, that can't have been the case. Paul was literate uh, and he could memorize and quote uh, the scriptures. 
if it were the case that the apostles that he's arguing with and trying to gain station with could not read the scriptures, they couldn't even read the scriptures, Paul would be pointing that out, that he has superior or superiority over them, that they, he, can, he can read the scriptures and they can't, which tells me that they had to have been able to read the scriptures. These had to be educated rabbis. There's no possible way uh, the apostles could have been illiterate, uh, uh, random people. Uh, and, and that's clear from the letters of Paul. Uh, so I, I don't think it's even believable uh, that the apostles were illiterate. I think they were highly literate in the same way that the scribes of the Qumran for community were, for example. In fact, they have a lot of similar thinking patterns. They treat scripture a lot of the similar ways. Uh, they have a lot of similar values and goals and things like that. So these look very similar, uh, like the same kinds of people. And I'm sure that the original apostles were educated people in that sense. And that any, any claim later that they were, that which is a lifetime later, uh, was just made up to make them seem more impressive. Okay. Okay. More questions. Two more. Yes, sir. Two more. Um. Okay. Uh. All right, I'm I'm not gonna ask. Maybe I'll reach out to you and ask you because that's just a personal curiosity question I have right now, just based on that answer. But it's it's not really material to the debate. Um. Now, my next question is: What criteria does Pontius Pilate meet? to verify his existence that Jesus does not. Oh, Pontius Pilate, we have a contemporary, uh, one of the ambassadors uh, of the Jews from Alexandria to Rome, uh, wrote a whole book, and he was a contemporary of Pontius Pilate, wrote a whole book about him and mentions him in uh, the, some materials that we have from him. So we have contemporary attestation talking about him. Uh, we have Josephus who cites a, you know, a bunch of information about uh, Pontius Pilate. So we have a historian who's using sources, who knows a lot about Pontius Pilate. Uh, and a lot of that stuff is confirmed in other historians later. So we know Josephus isn't making it up. Uh, and we have a stone. We actually have an inscription commissioned by Pontius Pilate himself. Uh, it actually has his name on it. Uh, he probably touched it himself. Certainly, I'm sure he signed off on it uh, in, in its production. So um, we, have, we have really good evidence for Pontius Pilate uh, in that regard. Okay. Um, and just to be clear, because I heard you say a couple different things um which is uh, about about that whole the seed of david thing so what just to be clear um are you taking from paul's paul talking about jesus is the seed of david what do you think he meant by that what did he understand by that well we don't know first of all because he doesn't say um so we can only talk about what's possible what he what might he have meant uh, now we know he had to have said this, or he had to say this, even regardless of what he thought about Jesus, where he thought Jesus died or any of that stuff, it's prophecy. So it has to be true, right? So he has to make it true. And I'm sure you've noticed with intersectarian disputes with other Christians and Mormons and so on, um, when scripture has to be true, they will make up any cockamamie thing to make that scripture true. Uh, and you get this with the, the young earth creationists coming up with the Satan planting all the fossils and things like that, right? So to try and get Genesis to be true, literally, right? So uh, so when, when you have someone who has to come up with uh, a reason why this prophecy is true and fulfilled, um, they are open to coming up with a lot of very strange ideas about how to do that. Uh, now, we know Paul talks about seeds, uh, sperm, uh, basically biological inheritance, allegorically. In Galatians 3 to 4, he talks about uh, the Gentiles being the seed of Abraham, allegorically. So seed of David could also be in some sort of allegorical, cosmical, theological thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be biological. But also, and I pointed this out, uh, I have a really good treatment of it in Jesus from Outer Space, who, someone who wants to see like a really uh, brief, tight discussion of this with no in, you know, interrupting footnotes and stuff, um, is that the prophecy of Nathan uh, in the Samuel literature, the prophecy of Nathan says that God will take seed from the belly of David and make a, basically a future king who would sit a throne forever. Uh, uh, that, that prophecy, oh, okay. Uh, do you want me to keep going or do you want me to end there? You have to conclude. It's a seven sure. minute period. Yeah, that, that's cool. Uh, but people know where you can find more on that if you're interested in, on how it could be literally metaphysically true. So, No problem. Make sure you subscribe to the Brother Garfield podcast. Uh, the room is lit. We have passed through the... Uh, the opening presentation, uh, we went through round one, round two, round three. We are in a questionnaire section. Make sure you're subscribing to the Brother Garfield podcast. And uh, you he, you also have the uh, link to the cash app. It's a uh, dollar sign, ask Brother Garfield. 
Um, debaters are supported financially as well as the platform needs support financially to continue to uh, give us debates of this magnitude. We will now go over and we're in a questionnaire round. Uh, it's a seven minute period. So to make sure I'm clear to the audience, uh, to the moderators, as well as to the debaters themselves, it's only five questions. Um, so after the five questions, the time is dead. The seven minute period is just to give you the cap of the time frame but it's five questions. That's all you have. Um, Dr. Richard Carrier, uh, would you be sharing your screen for the seven minute period? I'll just speak. <clears throat> okay, so five questions and we're starting. One, one second. Yeah, I, I said, would you be sharing your screen for it? No, no, I won't. Thank you. All right, good deal. So the seven minute um, will start when you start. Dr. Richard Carrier will be asking five questions to the brother gorilla hebrew all right uh here i really i'm actually genuinely interested in your answer uh because i want to see if i have missed something that i need to cover in future work uh so i'm going to ask questions like this so my first question is where in paul does he say anyone and i mean the authentic letters of paul um or at least what mainstream scholars regard as the authentic letters of Paul. Just the seven, correct? Right, yeah. Uh, where does he say anyone saw or met Jesus before he died? Before he died? Mm -hmm. um, let's go back to the slides here. Um, he references again, like I said, the Last Supper. He calls him a minister to the circumcision. He says that he was born under the law. Um, in order to be born under the law, like I stated earlier, one would have to have been born under the authority of the people who enforced the Torah. Um, so him being born under the law, again, him having siblings, his reference to being born of a woman, uh, also his reference to him being the seed of David, which I think is a reference to Joseph being his actual biological father. I think all those things substantiate um, him existing or uh, Paul attesting to his existence or him being seen interacted with prior to, of course, his death. Okay, that's all you got. So there's nothing else. Okay. That's what I wanted to know. Um, <clears throat> and we went all over all that in the debate. So, uh, okay, just want to make sure we didn't miss anything. Um, mm -hmm. What? Here's my second question. Um, what evidence is there that the Gospels were written by anyone who had any reliable information about Jesus? <laughs> Reliable information. Um, it, to to say that the people, the gospel writers, it, we, we could textually criticize the gospels. Um, you could look at them, of course, as not being written by um the people that they're purported to be written by. But I I wouldn't say that the information was not reliable. Um, that's like saying that um people who wrote about events in the sixteen or seventeen hundreds, hundreds of years later, is not reliable. Um just or if they just have vague sources or just word of mouth so I, I i truly don't believe um that um they were unreliable at all yeah okay that's that's fair uh, I, 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 and, I, and i wouldn't say that that didn't doesn't speak to motive but i just wouldn't say it was unreliable yeah i i just want to give you the chance uh to answer the question so that it doesn't stay unanswered the, the question was specifically do you have any evidence I and mean, rather than presumption do you have any evidence that the gospels uh, were written by anyone who had any reliable information about Jesus? Like, do you have, do you have anything to cite other than uh, what you just said? Any well, evidence uh, of that? Also, additionally, uh, yeah, well, we could just look at um, their knowledge of history. Um, we do especially see, let's say, um, Luke, Mark, we, we see some historical issues in Luke and Mark, definitely. But um, just overall, the overall scope of history that they have is, you know, I would say generally reliable. The probability of reliability is high just for the for the time period. So, um, yeah, I would I would just say in and of itself, um, there's reliability. There's there's demonstration of knowledge of reliability for that time period. Definitely. OK. And is that it? We've covered everything. Yeah. That's all um, I got. OK. Yeah, I just want to make sure I, I didn't miss anything and that I got yes, I have all of the arguments here. Um, OK, uh, here's a here's a more fun one. Uh, as you know, uh, the name Jesus, uh, it's actually Yeshua, uh, was a common Jewish name. Uh, of course, lots of Jews were named that. Um, but it also means Yahweh saves uh, and thus essentially means effectively God's savior. Uh, do you think it's a weird coincidence that God's savior just happened to be named God's savior? Uh, no, because we can see uh, nomenclature throughout scriptures of people having um, names that indicate uh, a role that they will grow and 
to fulfill and live into. Now, one could say that that's a a, a, a fabrication or that's mythology, etc. But of course, just due to my beliefs, I believe that things like that, like even myself, um, my 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 government name, the given name that I was given by my parents is Adonis, right? Of course, which you mentioned the name Adonis, right? But Adonis, of course, is a Hellenization of the Hebrew word Adonai, meaning Lord, right? Lord in reference to leader. So I would say that my parents named me that, not even understanding what it meant because they didn't at the time. They just liked how it sounded. But it was an implication that I was born to be a leader. And of course, I have my whole life been a leader. So I would say that there's divine intervention towards the, the nomenclature for sure. Yeah, I was wondering if that's... Two questions left. Um, <clears throat> so in this debate, you made claims about Alexander the Great and Socrates as examples of cases that were similar to Jesus in state of evidence. But that wasn't true. I, I pointed out examples that that's wildly not the case. So, so now you know that's not the case. There's a lot more evidence for them uh, than there is for Jesus. Does it bother you at all that you didn't know that and that you were basing your conclusion on this belief about Socrates and Alexander? But now that you know there's less evidence for Jesus than for them, uh, and, and you didn't know that before today, uh, does that like give you any pause uh, or, or reflection on that? I thoroughly reject everything that you just said. Um, number one, uh, so, so again, like I demonstrated in regards to Socrates, much of right what is taught about Socrates or what is known about Socrates, what was written about Socrates, right, is about people who either extolled him or followed him, right? And a lot of that contradicts itself, right? So I think that that disqualifies or that takes away credence from the contemporaries and the eyewitness because there's so many conflicting reports there. So what I'm saying is I'm not I'm not acting as if the, the case of the evidence for Socrates is identical to that of Jesus. But what I am saying is there are similar issues with Socrates' history. Then, of course, when we go to, to Alexander, you miscategorize or mischaracterize, rather, what I said about Alexander. I said the primary sources for the information on Alexander, not that there was none, not that nobody attested to him, but the main ones came later. When we're dealing with antiquity, as you know, as somebody who is a doctor in it, there's a, often times where we don't see people written about by contemporaries or for whatever reason, the contemporary sources are lost. And we see people who have more complete information about historical figures come on a century later, a century and a half later, two centuries later. So I think you, you definitely mischaracterize that. Last question. Okay, good. Um, Okay, I, I don't. I'm, I'm not going to answer. The, I'm not going to ask this question well because I, I'm coming up with it right on the fly, and I'm not sure how to frame it correctly. Um, what just happened, like just now, when you answered my last question, um, you immediately went to a different subject than we were discussing about. Like, there's contradictions in the evidence about Socrates, but I never made an argument uh, about the contradictions being evidence against historical Jesus. I mean, historians are well aware of contradictory source material for historical people. That doesn't prove historicity. So I never made that argument, but you went there instead of uh, where I was going. Um, and then uh, you went to things like there's similar issues. Uh, then you went to this like apologetic about um, primary evidence, but that's not really what we're talking about. Like that's a different thing. What my first question was before this was the issue of establishing historicity is not a function of trying to find the best evidence or whatever. Um, it's a function of what evidence is there and evidence that is contemporary and eyewitness evidence is way better. Like that's what historians love. Like we want that. Right. Uh, and we have tons of that for Alexander and Socrates. We have none of it for Jesus. Um, and so my question is, is like, but you didn't think that like you, you thought otherwise before today. Um, that's, that's, and that's not true. And I, and I just answered that. So I don't, I don't understand you. You're okay. telling me what I, you're telling me what I didn't think. Right. And you're repackaging what I said again. I did not say that it was for, for, uh, to reiterate what I just said, that there was identical issues. I'm saying that there are issues. And especially in the case of Socrates, the witnesses or the evidence is written by his followers, kind of like how Jesus followers are the primary or the main sources that talk about him. Right. So though yeah. that was the parallel that I made. But also I talked about the problematic nature of the contradictions that exist right in the sources in regards to Socrates. So I, I think I've made it 
abundantly and redundantly clear at this point. Yeah, I don't understand I, why you're consistently mischaracterizing what it is that I'm I saying. I can say that I failed to ask that second question correctly. Then, because you just oh. repeated the same dodging of the question. And, and there, was, how, how, so there, there, I, there was, that, there was, there was no dodging. That. There was no there was no dodging at all. You don't have to like it. It doesn't have to fit into your pigeonhole. But there was certainly no dodging. And the only way that it works that I dodge is if you totally mischaracterize what I said, repackage it, and then present it to people. So I mean that's disingenuous. Richard Carey, was that the uh line of your last question? Uh yeah, right. I okay. done five. Yeah. Very good. So I just wanted to make sure, um, because that it seemed like you was going into that question and just in all fairness, um, gorilla took it and answered it but i wanted to make sure that that yeah was. i i don't think he answered the actual question i asked but i, I mean I don't, that's, that's uh, fair that's fair but, but i i don't I, there's nothing more that we can do about that so yeah uh, if that was the question <laughs> then he answered um and then it's, it, it'll be on the audience to uh make that decision um uh, make sure um you guys are following the uh, brother garfield podcast subscribe to it if you're just coming into the room uh, make sure you uh, send your financial support to support the debaters, the moderators, um, as well as the uh, creators of the platform in the future debates to uh, dollar sign ask brother Garfield on Cash App. Dollar sign ask brother Garfield on Cash App. This is the section we just concluded a questionnaire round and we'll be moving into the closing remarks. Um, firstly, we'll start with Gorilla Hebrew. Uh, for five minutes so let me get that time set and then we'll go into dr richard carrier uh, for five minutes we also have the post debate bill um that will be on the god first game platform on clubhouse so if you don't have clubhouse download the clubhouse app right quick and shoot over to god first game so you can share your thoughts in the chat or on the stage we're letting everybody on the stage um to have the bill so download the clubhouse app and then sh shoot into the uh, God First Game platform, which is the premier biblical platform on Clubhouse. Uh, Gorilla Hebrew, the five minutes are set. Would you be sharing your screen for the closing remarks? No, it's fine. We ain't share my screen. All right, I'm gonna read. Yeah, I'm gonna read a little bit, but we ain't sure. You start. All right. Again, first and foremost, I'm gonna give again all praise, honor, and glory to Yahweh, Bashim Yahweh, shout to Yahweh. Always goes to victory, and he, of course, is undefeated. Um. Taking y'all back to the beginning of my presentation when I presented the slides of meeting meet Dr. Richard Carrier, and I brought up many of the things that were said about him. Um, we've learned these things to be true, right? Carrier's methodology and conclusions in this field have proven controversial and unconvincing to most ancient historians. I think that the masses of the people here and myself also can agree that his uh, argumentation are is unconvincing, right? Um, now, let me go to the next slide. So it says a number of critics have rejected Carrier's ideas and methodology, calling it tenuous and problematic and unpersuasive. I certainly think that we all saw that on full display here today. Um, but enough on that, right? Um, going into some of the, the questions again, he, he had to totally repackage what it was I'm saying, he inferred that I absolutely had no idea of so, uh, other sources of Alexander the Great. When I affirmed that what I was referring to were the main sources, right, that are used for Alexander the Great. And I didn't just make that up off the top of my head. I actually did research and saw this referenced historically. So that's what I'm speaking to, not that I'm just totally in oblivion there. Um, I, I definitely want to reemphasize that I asked him a very specific question, right? And because he knew how bad that question was and how much of a blow it dealt to his argumentation, he tried not to answer it and play an elementary school game and bring Jesus into it when no, Jesus cannot be in the answer because the question is about who besides him can you liken unto him in his crucifixion since you're claiming that it was borrowed from outside and then repackaged in a Jewish way, right? Um, he said zero. No, none of the Savior gods he attempts to liken Jesus unto have the same type of death that is actually carried out by a person who is a verified historical figure. 
That is major. <laughs> that's huge. And again, that's why everybody saw him try to scurry up out of there on that one. Um, it's understandable, right? That's a hard blow. Um, a question that I wanted to ask him that I couldn't. And again, it's it's not all that material, but for now, as he answered rabbis, he said these were learned rabbis, he believes that created the cult of Christianity. I would just ask, what would their motive be in order to do that? Why would these learned rabbis just say, hey, we're going to go to Egypt, borrow some of that information and create our own savior cult? I don't understand what the motivation would be there, and I don't think it's it's clear. I believe, though, that uh, Dr. Richard Carey will definitely speak to that in the later work of some sort. Um, and I'm looking forward to reading about that indefinitely. Um, again, though, I just want to go over what I got. I got about a minute and a half. So let me just go over my conclusion just one more time so we can reemphasize uh, what we've been presented here. Uh, quick recap. The mainstream scholarly consensus holds that there was a historical Jesus that lived in the first century, Roman Judea, and he was probably baptized and crucified. Mysticism is rejected as a fringe theory by virtually all scholars of antiquity. A number of critics have rejected Carrier's ideas and methodology, calling it tenuous, very weak or slight, or problematic and unpersuasive. Tacitus attests to a historical Jesus. Josephus attests to a historical Jesus. The Talmud attests to a historical Jesus. Paul attests to Jesus' nuclear biological family, a ministry, the Last Supper, a conversation with Pontius Pilate, his death, his burial, being seen by 500 people simultaneously. But Dr. Rich here says Paul never places him in human history or even believes him to have been a man that walked the earth. With that, again, I give all praise, honor, and glory to you. How about you? I was shy and I rest. All right. Let me secure that time. For really, he concludes his five minute closing remarks with about 30 seconds left on the clock. Uh, make sure y'all are following the Brother God. Um, Garfield podcast. Uh, we are in the closing remarks section of the debate, bouncing it over to Dr. Richard Carrier. Um, Dr. Richard Carrier, would you be sharing your screen for the closing remarks? Uh, yeah, I'll be sharing two slides. I'll start with speaking, but then I'll bring slides up. All right, good deal. So um, I'll start the time when you start. You have five minutes. Okay. Um, so on, on that last point, uh, I'll just let people know that I have a whole section, both chapters four and chapters five of On the Historicity of Jesus are entirely about why this cult was developed in order to solve certain pressing political and social problems in Judaism at the time. Uh, it actually makes a lot of sense in context as to why someone would come up with this. And they might even have come up with it sincerely because they're trying to find hidden messages in scripture. Uh, and we know there's lots of ways people come up with really elaborate beliefs. Uh, in, when they're doing that and trying to find that in, in that way. So um, it isn't necessarily that they were like Machiavellian and trying to actually steal things or invent things. Uh, their subconscious might have actually thought this way. And in much the same way uh, that Judaism adopted the idea of the apocalypse and the general resurrection from Zoroastrians uh, during the exile, uh, they got that idea. They said, well, this Zoroastrian God can resurrect all his people and there's going to be an end of times that's going to uh, solve all problems. Uh, well, if a great God can do that, then our God can do that. And so then they imported it into Judaism. And now it's like a mainstream standard feature of Judaism, the idea of the apocalypse and the resurrection. Uh, in the same way that they did that, and probably did that perfectly sincerely, uh, or they might they might have done it, uh, you know, insincerely, but uh, it could have been sincerely. And uh, I think the same thing's happening here. Uh, that Every time Judaism is pressed upon by a great empire, uh, it adopts elements of the religion of its uh, ruling empire, and revamps, sort of does a, a revolution in their religion to make the religion better uh, in that context. And I think Christianity is another attempt at that. Uh, it was a failed attempt because it did not win any popularity in Judaism. Uh, but I don't think the people who invented it thought it would fail. I don't think they really genuinely thought it would succeed. Um, now, it got lucky and, and succeeded in the Gentile world, world, and that's a whole other story. Uh, but I think their intentions at that time uh, were to do this, were to adapt their religion to the new circumstances. And they might have sincerely believed that God was telling them that that was, that was what he wanted them to do. Uh, so, uh, but they also might have just done it in a more uh, Machiavellian manner, but uh, we don't know that, but it could be either one. Um, so let me uh, recap real quick. I'm going to bring my slides up, share screen. Here we go. We'll bring up that thing. Now, this is what is the main feature is the sequence of evidence is weird. 
And this is why my point about Alexander is important and, and why uh, Gorilla Hebrew was completely avoiding my point. Um, it doesn't matter what the primary evidence is or what the best evidence is for Alexander. What matters is, is that when Alexander was alive, we got generated a ton of evidence, eyewitness and contemporary evidence of his mundane existence. Uh, and then, you know, mythologies were built later, even actually, even during his own life, myths were built around him, contradictory stories and so on. But the thing is, is we have tons of really good evidence during his lifetime from that time uh, that he existed. And we don't have that for Jesus. Uh, and the same for us, Socrates. Uh, you pick any other person, Pontius Pilate and so on. Uh, we don't have that for Jesus. For Jesus, we have the opposite. What we have is the earliest evidence is not even really contemporary, uh, no eyewitness evidence. The earliest evidence we do have, which is close to contemporary, like Paul was at least alive during the time, uh, entirely talks about this as a revelatory being. He never mentions anyone ever meeting or seeing him before his death and his uh, post-resurrection visions. So uh, that's weird. We don't have that. That's not how the evidence goes for Socrates. It's not how it goes for Alexander. It's not how it goes for Pontius Pilate. And then half a century later, which is a really long time back then, because uh, uh, for various reasons, half a century later, we get these very fictionalized, very mythologized uh, stories, these tales that are very religious. They're hagiographies. They're uh, these holy texts about a revered figure. They're highly mythologized. And then we get that. Uh, and then it's, you know, decades and decades later, we start to hear about anyone else noticing this religion and the Jesus and all their information comes from the Gospels. So this sequence of evidence makes very little sense, makes a lot less sense if Jesus existed. It makes more sense if he was a revelatory being and got historicized over time, uh, just as happened to many other uh, savior figures. So uh, that's the main reason I think you got to look at it. You got to look at the chronology in the context. Uh, I can't. I, were you speaking? I couldn't hear. Your your audio's out. Did I lose your audio? There's less than one minute left. I'll give okay. you twelve more <laughs> seconds. Clock. Okay, I hear you now. Um, so again, when we look at this, we see there's a trend. Every culture, the Syrians, uh, even the Celts, uh, the Egyptians, uh, the Greeks, all of these, uh, you know, the the Syrians and other uh, religions. All of these cultures, they each develop their own savior God that makes sense uh, in their own religious context. And to the extent that we could almost expect that the Jews should have come up with one. In fact, that they kind of, they were the last one to the game. That culture, when they developed their own hero savior, they went to their scriptures and they built a scripturally based Jewish version of this savior God. Uh, and like I said, they were, they say, when Paul says that they were finding hidden messages in scripture. They were finding these secrets uh, and they're having revelations confirming these things. So it isn't necessarily that they were like deviously doing this. They might've been, but they might've actually genuinely believed that God had said, oh no, there, this is the true savior God. And here's how he's perfectly Jewish. And here's how he solves all of your problems. Uh, and it fits the uh, popular marketable version. And so I think that's why Jesus is not like Socrates uh, or Alexander. And we need more evidence and we don't have it. Thank you. Make sure if you came in tonight, you don't leave until you subscribe to Brother Garfield podcast. We're going to give uh, uh, Dr. Richard Carrier and Gorilla Hebrew uh, an additional 30 seconds to plug wherever you guys are. Um, so Gorilla Hebrew, if you can, can you plug any of your information where people can continue to follow you to be edified? 30 seconds. I can't hear you. Uh, you are muted, Gorilla Hebrew. The problem. Now I see the problem. My fault. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So you can follow us on YouTube. S i c a r i i Sakari on YouTube. You can follow me on follow me personally on all social media platforms. Uh, G r l a Hebrew, Gorilla Hebrew. All social media platforms, man. All praises. Good deal. Excellent job uh, tonight, Gorilla Hebrew, on the decorum and uh, presentation. And Dr. Richard Carrier, excellent job on the decorum and presentation on your end as well. Uh, if you can, just utilize 30 seconds where people can follow you at and uh, any information you want to plug right quick. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you so much, Corey. You did a really good job moderating this. I, I appreciate it. Uh, it went very smoothly, uh, certainly more so than uh, in other debates. So 
Uh, I appreciate that. So uh, no, it's good. It's good. Thanks. Uh, and thanks, Gorilla Hebrew, for engaging. Um, uh, I, I thought you were, I mean, I think I, I disagree with all of your religious beliefs, but I think you're at least being reasonable from within your point of view. Uh, so uh, so that that was worth it. I, I do think you were a little bit uh, insulting and ad hominem in some of your presentation, but um, I think you could uh, dial back on that and uh, focus more on the facts. Um, as far as more stuff about me, richardcarrier.info.info, uh, you can just find that, uh, go to my website. That's all things Richard Carrier are there. Books, uh, my online courses, um, my blog, uh, my social media, if you want to follow me on Twitter or Facebook, uh, and such things like that. And then and all of the stuff that we've talked about today, I've probably written a blog article about it, and it will cite my, uh, my pu peer-reviewed published work and things like that, too. So you can do follow-up through there. And I write on many other subjects. This isn't the only one. Uh, that I do, but it's the one that I, I guess I have become best known for. Uh, good deal. So yeah, make sure you are subscribed to the Brother Garfield podcast for not only for this debate, um, it'll be published on that platform as well as for future debates that we've been in talks of uh, putting together with uh, Brother Garfield spearheading uh, those debate PhD scholars, um, Israelite debaters, um, and more. Uh, so be prepared for what's to come. Um, as what has already happened. Excellent debate tonight um, for most debaters, both debaters. Uh, d a high level of decorum um, because we're talking about a debate that started at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and uh, is over three hours. So um, you definitely kept your decorum, um, you know, on a high level. I want to say something to the audience as well. It, it's not like for uh, any form of debater to put together a presentation. It takes a lot of time and effort um and time away from family uh time away from work to put these things together so um you know we have a lot of people in the room if you can show your support by sending it to cash app dollar sign ask brother garfield that really helps the debaters it helps the platform to continue to grow um to make sure edification is coming out so that can be your support um by simply doing that so make sure you agree about something yeah, I just I want to say something, um, if I could, just a uh, Dr. Richard Carrier. Yes, um, aside from all this, I, I was briefly looking into your works, your writings on Hitler. Very interesting stuff. I was liking what I seen. I'm definitely going to look more into it. And I suggest other people check it out. Um, I did. I did something kind of similar a few months ago. I'd never seen anybody else really do any work like that. So I, I definitely like what I saw. And I'm going to look more into it. Yeah, that's a really interesting story uh, that I ran into by accident and also is an interesting story about how I ran into it. And it ended up changing Hitler studies. Um, I'm now a footnote <laughs> in scholarly books. That's on great. That. Um, great. Yeah, I would love to be back sometime to talk about that. Uh, but that's a whole other thing. And But there's stuff on my op blog articles on my blog for people who want to like, what has Richard Carrier discovered about Hitler? Uh, it's it's in there. So. Definitely. Definitely. And it's an uh, interesting turning point, especially on... Um, in the uh, Israelite community to being able to present information on this magnitude, just like the brother um, Alazar Ban Loya spoke about uh, earlier. So we'll have more of this, more edification coming out, more uh, juggernauts clashing on this level. We have a post-debate build on the God First Gang platform on Clubhouse, which is the premier platform. Uh, make sure guys go over there for the post debate and uh you can follow me simply on ig i ain't got no posts on that yet uh but follow me simply on ig and on clubhouse as a t-h-e christian Corey, the christian Corey on ig you can follow me over there other than that um i feel like the opponents did uh excellent and a great platform brother garfield thanks for having me all right hey hey ladies and gentlemen thank you for supporting the platform and you know what some of my moderators not used to some of the sikari family sikari is my family let's let y'all know that in the chat and somebody must have timed out your wife gorilla tell her please i apologize <laughs> we, oh. family, we family i don't know which one of the, i mean i know you, you got more than one wife but whoever it is listen man when i come to the ga or wherever you at you know dinner is on me man you yes know, sir I yes sir and listen, man, we're going over to um Corey. Get out of here, Corey. Get out of here. We don't need to no, go. No, no. go sit up. Go sit up the after show. We're jumping over there right now, man. We're gonna go over there right now, and we're gonna have we're gonna talk about this debate. And I'm, I'm gonna come on the panel, and we're gonna do what we need to do. I want to say everybody, we're gonna we have some big things coming up, some big headliners coming up. Deacon might be doing something here in a couple of weeks. 
um, and and we might have a double team debate and all that stuff, and um, different scholars and so forth gonna be debating. So we are gonna have some fun, man. Whether it's the Trinity, whether it's um, prophecy, whether it's something to do with the biblical text, we are gonna have some some discussions here. Seventy A.D. How historical is it as far as going into West Africa and what um, and so forth? So again, my apologies to the Sakari family. The, the moderator is not used to y'all. I know y'all. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they're not. They're not used to the crazy side of Sakari. All right. So at the end of the day, we gonna go over there. We gonna have some fun. Hey, Doctor Carrier, I'll hit you up in the morning. And um, Gorilla, I, I'm gonna see you over there. I'm, I'm yes, sir. In the morning, and we talk. All right, yes, thank sir, you, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in. As a matter of fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the link in the chat for five, ten minutes. If anybody want to jump on and make a quick comment about the debate, you could come on and just make a quick comment about the debate. I don't know if Dr. Carey want to stay on, but if you want to come on and make a comment, jump on. I'll do a quick 10, 15 minutes while they sit up over there. All right? Sikari, y'all did y'all thing. Y'all supported and showed y'all love. I thank you all for the contributions that y'all made. This is definitely going to the debaters, and we and we're gonna do more of this, man. We're gonna do more of this. <laughs> and smile, say you call crazy logic. If anybody wants to jump on, let's jump on. In the meantime, support us, donate to askbrothergarfield at gmail.com. <laughs> Tribe of Isacha, she's mad with me. <laughs> she's like, I'm unsubscribing right now. <laughs> all right, man. If nobody's coming on. Peace and love. Hey, Dr. Carrier, thank you, man. You guys yeah. did good, and we'll talk tomorrow. Peace and love. Yeah, you bet. Right. Good night. Good night, my brother. Peace.